we go. Yeah, we kick off. All right. Yeah. Well. Yes. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thought we'd get this started so everyone can catch the sunset <laughs> up on deck. And not keep you in here forever. Um, so this, this, I don't, it, I, I leave it open to you guys what we want to get into. I'm happy to give a quick overview, kind of the big picture of why I think um, we should be looking at rewriting kind of a lot of the story of history. We've a lot of these topics we've touched on uh, on the tour so far. And, and I just, this is like the, I think I can go through like all of the vectors that I think that are affecting the story of history. And then the last one that we can spend a bunch of time on is kind of the ancient tech. Obviously that's where most of my material focuses, but also Kyle and Russ have got excellent material on, you know, some of the architecture and the unfinished work that we see that he's got some great material on that. And we can do a Q and A if you want to just whatever topics you want to get into or if you want to hear about something specific, say the tube drills or the phases, I, I do have slides and we can get into those details. I can give you an update on the phases uh, and quickly run through that. I say quickly, probably take me an hour. Uh, <laughs> but it's up to you. So, I mean, maybe I'll just start with this, in, with this, the, my general overview that I like to give and then we'll open it up and say, well, which way do we all want to go uh, with what topic you want to hear about? So, we need you. It, it doesn't have to be formal, just chit chat. Okay, let's get, you know who I am, we've been together for enough time. So, in some of you may have seen this before, if you've watched my Tale of Two Industries, or the Cosmic Summit presentation, you would have seen this, but I like, I like to go through this and just to give some context on what is the story of history, particularly the history of civilization, uh, as, as we know it, and, and kind of as it is accepted and taught in schools, and all of the beliefs that, uh, you know, everybody has just m running around in the back of their mind to one extent or the other, but uh, I like this um, place to start. It's a New Scientist article published in 2006, so not that long ago. It's this this uh, this century. I should see, and, and this is more or less still where it sits today. Yeah, this is published 4 September 2006. Just the, the timeline of human evolution. So we'll, we'll lay out the the overall story, and then we'll see how things have changed, and I think what what vectors are really forcing a change onto this uh, standard model of. Uh, the history of civilizations and indeed of Homo sapiens ourselves on the planet. And it really starts around 195,000 years ago. So this is when our species Homo sapiens first appeared on the scene and then shortly after began to migrate across Asia and Europe. This is the out of Africa concept. And at the time, 195,000 years was the oldest human remains that we'd found uh, on Earth, right? So as little as, you know, less than 20 years ago, we were thought to have been around 200,000 years old as a species. You go back in time for a long time, we, we were thought to be about 50,000 years old. And then before that, you kind of get into the biblical references and the 6,000 years, is it 6,000? 6, 6,000 years. Uh, and, you know, we, we get that information from, um, from our religions. And then around 50,000 years ago, we start to see evidence for this, um, the great leap forward, the development of, of cultural and symbolic practices, people start burying their dead, they, they potentially start to domesticate uh, dogs. This is also the period where uh, Australia is, first, is, is seen to have first been colonized by modern humans. Uh, we start to see cave paintings from this period. It seems to be the, the beginning of this, I guess, abstract concepts coming into society and, and you see worship and, and ceremony starts to pop up and that seems to have happened from around 50,000 years ago. Then 12,000 years ago, this was a big one uh, in the Americas. This is when modern people first reached the Americas. That's what they always said, that 12,000 year old uh, boundary, often referred to as the Clovis boundary, the Clovis people, roughly 12,000 years ago. That's the first bit of evidence for, well, as far as we know, or did then, uh, for peopling of the Americas. 10,000 years ago is roughly the date that agriculture is first thought to have emerged, uh, particularly in the um, the Crescent Valley, the, the and, and, and to, Anatolia, yeah, the northern end of what was Mesopotamia. And then, to s stick with the same years ago nomenclature, 6,000 to 5,500 years ago, or 4,000 to 3,500 BC, was the Sumerians of Mesopotamia developing the world's first civilization, right? Shortly followed by the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese, everybody else came after that. So it's... This is the date for civilization some 6,000 years ago. And it's an interesting concept, and I think 
this is the story that we're told in school and essentially to we all know it to some degree or other but it, it, it really tells this story of roughly this right we were in the stone age we were neolithic we were hunter gatherers very primitive people and in this period of some six thousand years alone we've basically gone from the stone age to the space shuttle right and i know it's not a linear line like there's ups and downs developments and falls within that that progress and certainly in the last several hundred years has been, I mean, huge technological progress uh, and civilizational progress. But this is the concept that's embedded in our heads and maybe at the end we'll come back to this if we have time, but I, I think this is an interesting concept to consider what we could achieve if we can change this. That this if, if we could think of ourselves in a different context rather than this one linear path from you know, primitive to civilized as if this is the only time we've ever been advanced and this is the only way to do things what might it look like if we thought about it a little bit differently? Because ultimately this whole concept is what I would consider a tenet of our modern human identity, right? It's one of those pillars of how we think of ourselves and how we position ourselves into that story of history and our place on the planet, right? I think it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental concept that's baked into modern civilization. We think of ourselves as the only advanced civilization and this being the way that it's done, the only way that it's done, uh, as if it's some sort of preordained path we don't have to worry too much about it. So this standard model of history been in place for quite a while. It's still more or less, I mean, look at Wikipedia, there's a bastion of truth, <laughs> such as it is. And you'll still see a lot of those numbers reflected from that, that, that standard model of history. But in, a, in those last 20 years, there's, there's certainly been a lot of vectors that are really pushing, putting pressure on that standard model. Uh, and they're not just things like, you know, tube drills and saw cuts and the stuff we're looking at here. But they're coming from all across different areas of science, including within archaeology itself. So there's been new discoveries within archaeology that should be challenging this model. Uh, obviously, the, the human timeline itself, there's been discoveries made in fields like genetics um, and, and just the complexity of our past. We're discovering new species. This is all putting pressure on that story of history, I think. Uh, this has been talked about by many people. But origin stories. So we're also learning with the development of cataclysm that a lot of these origin stories have these grains of truth and they all tell a similar tale around the world, right? This story of our ancestors being advanced and then and their civilization just being destroyed through flood or through fire or something or through some form of cataclysm. And then this is a consistent theme across almost every culture, modern or ancient. Even our own religions that are in place today, they tell the same story. Noah's flood. But then you have the Epic of Gilgamesh, or the tribes of South America uh, essentially describing the world ending by, by fire. Uh, Nordic traditions did this. Even the ancient Egyptians had a flood myth when Hathor drowned everybody. And they had to uh, basically get her drunk and make her fall asleep by mixing, I think it was barley and blood together. And she drank it, fell asleep. Finally, it stopped. she stopped drowning everybody. And then Tahoti or Toth had to teach men to be civilized again. That's an Egyptian flood myth. And then the, the key that's really unlocked this in my mind, and I know this is something that Graham Hancock and people have talked about for a long time, but cataclysm, the development and understanding, particularly in the last 20 years, of the evidence for, for true cataclysm happening on this planet has emerged in the last 20 years. There are a lot of people speculate, based on those origin stories, you know, Hapgood, Hancock, people would speculate that, you know, there seems to be this consistent theme, what happened? And, you know, Hapgood had earth displacement, theories and, and, and Graham Hancock in, in fingerprints. Uh, I think that was published, what, 95, 96? Velikovsky as well also is another author who talked about it. So there was a lot of speculation what happened because we, we seem to see these indicators of it, but then it's really only been in the last 20 years where we've had solid science now showing us what actually happened. And it's, and it's the Younger Dryas Cataclysm, this period known as the Younger Dryas, which is the boundary between the Pleistocene and the modern Holocene era that we're in today. Some roughly 13,000 years ago, uh, the Earth was just plunged into this devastate. We're coming nicely out of the Ice Age and the Glacial Maximum, and then we were just plunged into the depths of Arctic cold very rapidly for nearly a, around a thousand years, and then sort of bounced right back out, out of it. It coincides with a massive megafaunal <laughs> extinction that impacted, you know, specifically the Americas and Northern Europe in particular, but this was a global event. It coincides with the sea levels rising some 400 feet with, you know, over time, but with these massive meltwater pulses. And 
in the last 20 years, there's been a tremendous amount of science now done by people like the Comet Research Group. We have this thing, 150 plus peer reviewed papers now that, that are showing the truth of what happened and it was most likely a series of cosmic impacts and airbursts, probably the, the worst thing to happen to this planet in the last couple million years, as far as we know, and it would have absolutely been a civilization ender. There's even evidence now that shows that there are DNA bottlenecks in the human species uh, across that period that co correspond with the Younger Dryas um, period. And even in like the, where they think were completely unconnected groups of peoples, you have a, a massive decrease in male population and then in also just in genetic diversity. And this is one of the problems with science that isn't in the archaeological or historical field. They, they quite often are very reluctant to extrapolate what these details might mean for things like history because they know you're, you're playing in somebody else's sandbox. So this often, this sometimes get described as like, well, there was just a simultaneous change in like cultural breeding habits of all of these different peoples around the world and that might explain it. It's, it's pretty nonsense. It's totally seems like. coincidental. Totally coincidental, yeah. Unconnected groups of people that all of a sudden changed the way that they, they wanted to breed. And then, of course, my favourite field in this, on this, in one of these, technology, we can talk more about that. But I think there's plenty of evidence in the stonework around the world, and what's left to us from these ancient cultures, these out of place artifacts, which aren't just limited to Egypt, by the way. Well, obviously, we're here, we're looking at Egypt, but you get, you, we find these out of place artifacts, machined artifacts coming from Turkey. You find them in South America, and obviously, there's a huge connection in megalithic stonework all around the world. This polygonal work that seems to be, I don't, it's. <laughs> It's like they all chose to solve the same problem by doing it the very hardest way you could, which doesn't seem to be, you know. You can understand how people might develop napping and they're like, okay, we need to make a sharp object. And that's, you can get to a solution that way. When it comes to building a wall like that, it's like, I, I don't think it's just random chance that forced different groups of people in different time periods to choose the very hardest way of doing it with massive megalithic stonework put together so precisely it doesn't need mortar. Uh, I think it's more of a, a connection than that. It's, it's a technique that was developed and then deployed around the world. Okay, so just quickly, some of the new discoveries uh, in these different fields. I'm sure everybody's heard of Gobekli Tepe, but this was, to me, should have been a massive, um, a massive blow to the standard model of history. This was uh, a site that's in the southeastern region of, of Turkey, uh, near the city of Şenlerfe, the biblical Edessa. We all went there was it April last year and saw it for the first time. Amazing site. It was actually first discovered in the 1950s by some um, some farmers originally who tried to, were picking rocks in the field and they tried, they tried to move these rocks, figured out they couldn't move them, they're too big. And then when uh, the archaeologist at the time looked at them and said, well, that's too modern, it's some like a Byzantine cemetery or something, it's not very old at all, and they left it alone, but it wasn't until the 90s when the German Archaeological Institute started to excavate and they found, well actually this is very old and it's also unique stonework that we've never seen. And so they started to excavate and they've uncovered what is a, a massive megalithic site. They've only, un they've only uncovered five, some five to 10% of it, but they've scanned the area and they know there's a lot more. It's made up of all of these stone circles that are arranged in geometric patterns. In fact, there's been some studies showing that some of these stone circles have formed equilateral triangles with each other. It's not like a random set of stone uh, stone circles. There are also alignments on these sites as they are with many uh, um, megalithic sites, so alignments to celestial movements and sunrises and lunar cycles and all that type of thing. There are, there are studies that, that get into those details. But the stone circles themselves consist of these T-pillars. I'm sure you've all seen them. Some of them ranging up to 18 feet tall, being more than 15, 20 tons single piece T-pillars and they're inset into sockets that have actually been cut into the bedrock. So if you look at this picture of Gobekli Tepe, when we first went there, I thought, I was looking at the floor there and I was thinking, is that like, did they cement this floor over to make it smooth so people could walk on it? No, this is, this is the bedrock. So it's not, they didn't just dig these T-pillars into the ground, they actually cut the whole thing down to the bedrock and then flattened the bedrock and created little pedestals and insets where they would insert these stone pillars. So it is fairly sophisticated. Uh, stonework, and then also these these T pillars are famous for their artwork, right? This high relief carving that's on them, where you're carving away negative space, and it's not just basically. Some of it's only a little bit, it's only uh, a short sort of, it's only raised up a little bit. But some of the other carvings are huge, like they're they're very very high relief carvings. So it's and it's just beautiful artwork. 
not just T pillars, there's also buildings, quarries, stone cut systems there. Um, I talked about it being astronomically aligned and I think we'd also mentioned in one of the days like the work of Martin Sweatman who who has decoded the symbology on that site to really match up with star uh, constellations and it essentially forms a celestial calendar. And what's interesting about the site is that it was carbon-14 dated to at least 12,000 years old. I don't know if you guys want to take this bit because they've definitely been diving into uh, go back to Tepe quite a lot. Uh, and I still haven't <laughs> removed the deliberately buried from here. It's, I should. It used. It was thought. It, yeah, it was thought to have been deliberately buried. The new evidence on this site suggests suggest that it really wasn't. That it is just accumulated midden on that site is is caused the burial. But what's interesting to me, and also Kyle and Russ, when we were there and, and looking into the research around this, the way they dated this site, it actually the dating comes from these these small walls that are made up of small stones and just local stones that are that are basically built around these t-pillars and they encompass the t-pillars like they said that in some places these t-pillars have been broken and they're supporting the t-pillars but it, it's a it's a very different style of building it's almost as if this site was broken down and then somebody else came along and, and decided to fix it up and stand the t-pillars up and, and make it again as best they could by using these these cobblestone walls that they would build up and it was material inside these cobblestone walls that was dated as being at least 11,000 years old and in fact, on this site, and then also Karahan Tepe, which I'll mention in a minute, there's actually pieces of broken T-pillars used in the walls. Mm. Which is like, okay, mm. if it's the same people making this site, how come they're doing this? And, and some of the T-pillars and the erosion is just tremendous. Mm. I mean, it, to me, this looks like two separate periods of occupation, two separate periods of building. And we know that the second, the, the, the walls that came later, in, and in a lot of cases, these walls actually cover up the carvings on the on the T pillars, so you can see where they're carved, but they're just they're just covered up uh, because they built these walls. Uh, but we know that this more primitive second phase of occupation is at least eleven to twelve thousand years old, and who knows how old the older uh, parts of it are. So this should have been a huge blow, or not a blow, but it should have been cause for change, I think, to the standard model of civilization. This was the answer to Mark Lehner's refutal of uh, Robert Schock and John Anthony West's dating of the Sphinx as being around 12,000 years old uh, due to rainfall erosion. When, when, when Schock first presented that, he was kind of laughed out of the room and Mark Lehner is famously quoted as saying, show me the pot shirts. So show me something else that is megalithic or something, other proof that something was happening 12,000 years ago. And they hadn't discovered, though they hadn't announced Gobekli Tepe at this point, but it's like, hey, here you go. 12,000 years old, it's a massive megalithic site, it's not very far from uh, Egypt. And, uh, and uh, it's just, it, it hasn't changed anything. In fact, I mean, this, this takes, in my mind, takes civilization to build. You, you know, this is a huge site. And when you combine it with the other discoveries in the region that I'll mention in a sec here, I think it takes civilization to build this. You have to allow people to develop specializations to be able to go and do this sort of rock carving and, and quarrying and all the work that's associated with this. Uh, you, it's not just something that happens on the weekend when these hunter-gatherer dudes are trying to get away from the wife and the kids, right? And, and just let's go carve some massive stones. Um, shits and giggles. Shits and giggles, right. Yeah, so you need to have other people growing the crops, making the food, like allowing people the time and resources to then specialize in particular crafts to make this happen. It takes a social organization. It's also a big, big site. And not only that, but Gobekli Tepe was the first site discovered in this region, but now they found also, uh, much more recently, I think, uh, last decade, they found Karahan Tepe, which is actually, it's older and it's around five times larger than Gobekli Tepe. There's more than 250 T pillars at that site that have been discovered, possibly a thousand, up to a thousand. It's also an incredible site, active archaeological site. They're digging it up, but very similar to Gobekli Tepe in, in its formation, with all this sophisticated bedrock work and a lot of T pillars and shapes carved from the bedrock, kind of like the Sphinx enclosure. In fact, I've seen some stuff in Egypt recently that very much reminds me of some of the shapes and carvings at, at um, Karahan Tepe. It's much larger, it's, it's at least 500 years older based on the carbon dating, which again comes from the midden and the other, uh, the other elements of it. There are permanent dwellings at Karahan Tepe, so again, this isn't hunter-gatherers and nomadic peoples, this is people that lived in a particular place. It's, it takes civilization. <coughs> and the most astonishing part about this is that, that now, 
that we're up to between 40 and 80 new sites just in this region are now have now been discovered. So it started with Gobekli Tepe and now we're discovering these massive installations and stone pillars and small cities essentially being discovered in that southeastern region of Turkey. And that's civilization. I don't care. You, I, it's, you won't convince me otherwise, I don't think. It's like a whole chapter of human history that we know nothing about that's just coming to light. And the equivalent example that I give of another, well, there's another example of this, which is the Amazonian forest. If you've watched anything Graham Hancock's had to say in the last few years, he's talked about how the clearing of the Amazon is revealing gigantic earthworks, these geometric forms, and the remnants of cities that were the size of London in the 1600s in the Amazon. Dozens and dozens of them. And we just have, we know nothing about that. We have no records. There's a few rumors and tales, but we have no records of it. It's these entire chapters of human history that are just unknown to us, but we're starting to uncover them. Before you go to the yeah, logos. Just want to point out, um, as Ben was just saying, the uh, Mark Lehner kind of famously said, show me the pot shirts. Uh, and this was his refutal of, of the idea that there was any civilization around 12,000 years ago to build the Sphinx. <clears throat> And this is interesting because it, uh, it shows how, like, a lot of times there are what we call stacks of assumptions built into the arguments that people will make about ancient civilization. So the assumption there is the, any civilization that's capable of making something like the Sphinx or any megalithic stonework is going to have pottery. But Gobekli Tepe, the lowest levels, are associated with a, with a lithic culture yeah. called PPNA. It stands for pre-pottery. Neolithic A. So now, you know, 20, however many years after Lehner made this, asked this question and, and destroyed, you know, destroyed Shock's argument, we now have a known megalithic stone culture responsible for building Gobekli Tepe that is pre pottery, according to the standard model. So his, his question is either, uh, it's interesting because that either destroys his question entirely, now you can't demand potsherds if you find. <coughs> stonework, or we still need to know where the potsherds are for the people who built Gobekli Tepe, because it's not the PPNA people that built it. Yeah. Correct. I'm sorry, is the word potsherd? Potsherd. Yeah, like, like shard, but it's shard. with an E. Okay. Yeah. Pot, it's archaeological nerd. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. I was going to say it's a fancy archaeological nerd. <laughs> yeah. Potsherd. Only the initial. <laughs> potsherd. I'll just say, we will we'll see great examples of this, like when we go to Elephantine Island. Uh, yeah. the, the entire site around the box that we're going to be looking at is like 20 feet under almost solid potsherds. Midden of just filled with pottery. And so he does make a good point, Lehner, when he's, when he's like, you should see this. The fact that you don't see it at Gobekli Tepe really suggests that <coughs> the, 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 the PPNA people didn't build it. I think that's probably, yeah. that in other words, he is making a good point. Yeah, right? it is. where are the points? Where are they? Right, because so, they're ignoring his point for this site. Yes. That's the problem. That's what's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And yeah. so, in, in, <laughs> in, in so doing, you could you can conceive of people traveling somewhere else and building something, but but their progress to become a civilization capable of doing that doesn't need to be at the place yeah. that they're building. Yeah. It's not evidence. Yeah. We can talk about go back to Tepe a lot. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if that's where we want to go, let me know, and I'll get through. I'll try to get through this intro first. So. <laughs> Clovis. Clovis. Yeah. So in the Americas, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'm not going to in and out. I'm not going to spend much time on this one. But that Clovis doctrine was a heavily defended. It literally was a doctrine in the American archaeological archaeological group for a long time. And anybody who suggested that they had found evidence for humanity outside of or beyond that time, older than that, twelve thousand year, it faced a similar fate to. to to shock, and they were literally laughed out of the room by the old boys' club. And this this happened to a, a guy named Jacques Sigmars, who who, di who discovered a uh, place called the Bluefish or the Bluefin, Bluefish Caves, which he dated with bone fragments and like modern human bone fragments to around twenty five thousand years old. And it 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 ruined his career, it's his life. Like he went into a depression. He 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 didn't go back into the field after. And this was just as a result of him being laughed out of the room by his peers because he was a member of the archaeological establishment. 
and it and it just shows you the example of how some of these things get treated and how, how this doctrine gets just driven into the fabric of the academics who run this particular branch of science uh, and it's unfortunate and but now and again over time we've got now seven or eight nine more sites around the americas you can see a, a map of them there all with strong indicators of human presence going back tens of thousands of years before the clovis doctrine uh, and in fact even the Saruti mastodon site which you can talk about it's a controversial site but it's you know it goes back to 130,000 years ago definitely the evidence for tool use uh in in what they were doing there they found it i think they were digging a road in san diego or san jose uh, they found these worked up mammoth bones that were, were crushed to get at the marrow but it was done with with sort of stone hammers and stone tools which is an indication of you know hominids being in there so that's all being changed and funnily enough one of the things that's that, that happened that helped the younger dry uh, science group get engaged they would go to clovis sites in the americas because they were so well researched they would dig down to about that 12 to 13 thousand year boundary they really wouldn't dig much deeper but they were very well um dug sites and sort of just disciplined in their scientific approach so the strata layers and the dating was very was bang on so then they could go down to these known dated layers of strata in the ground and then look for these uh, impact proxies, the, the shock synthesized nanodiamonds, the extraterrestrial platinum and iridium, all of these, these output features for this, uh, this cataclysm. And then they started putting all these papers together and then eventually once they, these guys cottoned on to what they were doing, which of course this, this story of cataclysm is a big, you know, it, it's upsetting the apple cart to the main story of history. to keep coming to these sites to to find this evidence for cataclysm and show the truth of some of these origin stories but yeah so the clovis doctor i would say that this is probably the one part of archaeology that seems to be, be shifting a, a little bit finally like they, there is now okay some acknowledgement that it seems likely that there were humans here before this time which is problematic for another reason um white sands yeah white sands, white sands is another sands. one it's, it's, it's huge right now i mean the, what they found yeah, they're finding it all over the place. And but again, the, the concept here, and we'll come back to this in a minute, is, is that you know, modern peoples reach the Americas through that Bering land bridge between the, the, uh, the, the ice sheets during the Pleistocene, and they came down through this narrow land bridge, which would have been quite a gauntlet back in the day, I've got to say, along with the short-faced bears and the cave lions and American lions and all the other predators there. And then they, they peopled the Americas in North America first, then Central and South America. And there's big problems with that. And we'll get to that in a second. But along the lines of just the human timeline, we've also made many new discoveries in terms of the human timeline. Starting with fossil records, there was a, a jawbone found in Morocco that shifted it back from 195,000 years to just over 300,000 years old as a species. This, was, uh, this is now the oldest human fossil that we have. But it doesn't stop there because these, these new studies into both uh, DNA evidence as well as uh, teeth morphology are showing us that our, that our race may well be a lot older than that even. So there was a study done looking at when the, the so Neanderthals are kind of genetically our cousins. They looked at, at, at based on the genome, when, when was the likely period that us and the Neanderthals diverged from a common ancestor? And it's in the range of 800,000 years. Uh, studies into teeth morphology, so the rate at which our teeth would have to change to get to our, the teeth that we have today. Uh, they thought, well, if we're you know, 200,000 years old, it's got to be this rate to make this happen. And they did all the statistical studies and analysis and said, well, no, that's not actually the rate at which our teeth change. It's very slow. And based on this, this, this rate of teeth morphology that was observed, it's somewhere in the range of eight to 900,000 years old. So. Those are like based on these sciences. I, I, I put the window, you could call it roughly a million years. I think the human race may have been here inside of a million years, but, but closer to a million than to, you know, 200,000 on this end. So there's all these, there's all these scientific discoveries from adjacent fields that should be having an impact on, uh, on the story of history, but they really don't. So yeah, we talked a bit about this. And then this was also a super interesting uh, study that, that speaks to that diaspora of humanity and the complexity of our past. This was a, a DNA study that looked at the different haplogroups and what they found, you can see with the red dots, what the red dots are showing are these affinities between the haplogroups of people living in Australasia, so Australia, Papua New Guinea, Southeast Asia, and the peoples of, of South America. So these are commonalities, right? What's interesting is that you don't find 
those affinities with the peoples of North or Central America. Because, and then this is, the problem is, is if you think about the way that they say humans got to the Americas through that, that Northern land bridge into the Americas, you would see those markers. Those markers should have traveled all the way down through here to then eventually end up in South America. Instead, what this study is suggesting is that there was at some point a huge Pacific migration. Enough, enough that it's left markers that are still uh, readable uh, in our genetic makeup today. So it's, it's showing you the complexity of the, of, of the true complexity of our, of our past. It's also challenging a lot of those established theories, the out of Africa theory, the age of the, uh, the human race. Um, this isn't Dennis Ovens, no, this is, this is us. Yeah. But then actually, Dennis Ovens and you know, Homo floresiensis, that's another good point. We keep coming up with a more complex genetic past. And one of, I don't often talk about it, we can talk about it when we get to Q and A's here if you like, but I, I do think that when you talk about previous civilizations, I'm not always, I, I, I think there's a possibility that it wasn't just us. Like we know uh, Neanderthals were here 40,000 years ago, it's fairly, fairly recently. Denisovans appear to have been, we've really only working with a couple of little bones with the Denisovans, but we're seeing a much more complex history and past. I mean, I for the longest time thought Neanderthals couldn't talk. And you guys, I think, corrected me and said, well, no, these recent studies have shown, no, they did have vocal cord development. They could actually talk. Lovely singing voices, by all accounts. And, and you obviously you need speech to create civilization. They had larger brains than us. I mean, they were sailors. We know that you made tools. You know, there's that Denisovan jade bracelet that shows evidence for machining, potentially. Um, so, yeah, we might just be the last humans left, but we may not have been the only ones that ever got to a point that you would call civilization. I don't know, it's just, it's just a possibility, I think, but it's like, I don't, wanna, I don't think we should just limit ourselves to, well, it could have only been us, because we're the, we're the last humans here today. It wasn't always the case. So we talked uh, briefly, we talked about the Younger Dry's Cataclysm, I think everybody here knows about it, but yeah, massive megafaunal extinction. Randall, I, I love hearing Randall Carlson talk about it. He, he, he tells the story, which makes a lot of sense to me, which was that, Basically, half of the megafauna on the planet got went extinct in a very short period of time. The megafauna that's alive today on this planet is the half that survived the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. So it wasn't just a few species, it was a lot of species. Right down to several species of birds. But huge, a huge range of species, particularly North South America and Europe. South America has suffered something like an 80% extinction rate on megafauna. Um, we're megafauna, we, we, only, we barely survived it, That's, that shows up in our own genetic history as well. Uh, and of course the explanation for this is, is overhunting, right? It was, it was nomadic paleo groups of people that just chucked spears at things until everything died, including the couple species of birds. And uh, I heard Russ telling this story the other night, it's one of my favourites too. It's like, if you want an example of how difficult that is, we tried with the bison in North America. And we had vehicles and firearms. And we still couldn't get the job done. Like there are still bison running around. Uh, you think that we were going up against much, much bigger, more savage, terrifying creatures that existed during that, that period of time and, and, and made them all go extinct in a very short period of time. I'm very skeptical. And there's many other bits of evidence that suggest there was, you know, they were, they were hit by something else. No doubt a lot of them went extinct due to climate change because it was a significant climate change uh, in a lot of the world. Like if, if it wasn't directly impacted by what happened with the flooding or fire, it had rapid climate change such that their ecosystems would have been devastated and they may have gone extinct that way. But yeah, it's a short window with a lot of stuff that went extinct so it, it really matches that, um, that uh, cataclysmic story. Yeah, just one note on the overkill hypothesis. Uh, the main argument was that people came over the Bering Land Bridge and the animals had never encountered uh, Homo sapiens. And so they were not afraid. They didn't realize we were predators. This is like one of the main arguments. And uh, well, that's destroyed because we know that people were here at least 23,000 years ago based on the white sand studies. So they were living amongst these megafauna and all these other animals for you know, thousands of years. So, yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a silly hypothesis. Oh, and, and I, I, I will make the point with that slide we were just on. Uh, when you talk about these, these geneticists also don't want to upset the apple cart. So they, they fall short of suggesting 
that this 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 is a troubling study for um, uh, for the story of history in that diaspora of it. They won't. They just don't go there in these studies. These guys know that you start you know treading on those domains of these other guys, fields of science, they're going to get upset. So uh, it's up to other people to kind of interpret um, uh, the results of this. So they you know they they use pretty weak language in what they're describing, but I think the findings in these things are, are pretty obvious. <coughs> similar to the. Um, Similar to the overhunting hypothesis, I mean, I think that's kind of dead in the water. But some people, a lot of people, still insist that's what happened, because they refuse to accept the evidence for cataclysm, which is super strong now, right? We, we've got, we might even have craters for it. There's a long we can talk about the Greenland ice crater, uh, Hiawatha. There's a, a lot to that story as well. But we see it at multiple sites now: Abu Huraya, Syria, uh, high temperature melting. This was a, Abu Huraya is a, fan, a fascinating site to, to look at. It literally shows like. Yeah, there must have been an air burst over the top of it that, that just melted stone, melted people, melted all sorts of things. It's been extensively studied. Uh, and then obviously in the last 15 years, there's you know, 150 papers now that are really, and more coming, even though that there, there's very much a, what does George call it? It's a, a climate mafia uh, in that peer review process that are trying very hard to prevent the publish and the peer review of, uh, of a lot of these papers coming from Firestone and West and these guys that are, doing a lot of this research, but that's that's the academic battle, I suppose. They started their own journal. Yeah, they started their own journal in the end, because they, they were putting pressure on journals to prevent their being published, so now they're, they're starting their own journal, which is good. Then, of course, we mentioned uh, the origin stories. We were looking at this on the bus today, the Mahabharata and the Vedic traditions, uh, the, the you know revelations in the Bible, you just have, if you, once you read that and you think about the, the idea of cosmic impacts and airbursts, you, you almost have like eyewitness accounts of it, like a fiery mountain descending from the sky, you know, the swarms of meteors, an iron thunderbolt. It's quite descriptive, but it's the, you know, I think we're looking at essentially these eyewitness accounts of things that might have happened that have now been deified and recorded into history as part of a story. Uh, Obviously, you've got to try and find the grains of truth in all of this, but we see it everywhere from every culture. It's a fascinating study. And again, Randall's got a ton of good lectures on it. I have a video on this concept, but it's all over the place. One of the things that Randall mentions, and if you watch his show, Cosmographia, he goes through this in detail, but it's interesting because we have modern, well, relatively modern day accounts that are very similar. Um, the... Uh, Siberia? Yes, it was Kunguska event was an airburst. Uh, a large object came down and exploded about uh, five miles, maybe, or five kilometers above the surface. And if you look at the accounts of what people said, they would say things like the sky split open, the heavens opened up like a doorway, uh, there was a huge sword in the sky, you know, uh, like the gods were coming down, they struck the earth. Uh, it's very similar to the same kind of imagery you get in these very ancient myths that come out of the depths of prehistory that, that uh, yeah, they're describing these these events. And Kyle just brought up the Chicago fires, Peshtigo fires, similar stuff. And these happened on the same day, practically the same day. It's fireballs coming out of the sky, uh, just completely immolating entire towns and people, forests, uh, where they vanish without a trace. And the, a lot of the eyewitness accounts sound almost religious in nature because of the you can you can kind of feel the the impact that this had on people when something this large happens and if you're just imagining something coming out of the sky and it's starting to burn and it cuts this bright line across that you can barely look at like a welding arc all the way across the sky and then explodes at the end it looks like it like the gates of heaven open and that's how it gets described so you can see how it's possible that a lot of these stories that have this imagery where you're just like that, what, what is this that they're describing? It's a literal description of what actually happened. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the Tunguska event also started a religion yeah. in the area. It did. They yeah. started up a religion based on it. There's photos. If you have not seen Tunguska, you can see the photos of where the Siberian forest is just flattened like matchsticks. These huge trees and it's just in, in this from the epicenter just in this massive spiral out outwards it was and there's a tiny little blip you know it was it was a nothing burger yeah so like 800 square miles yeah 800 square miles of devastated yeah flat yeah <laughs> what's the site uh, the biblical um sodom and gomorrah that 
uh, we were looking at at the Cosmic Summit. That's a great yeah. story too. It's not younger. Dr Tell El Hamam, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we at the Cosmic Summit, we had the I forgot his name, Doctor Collins. Yeah. 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 Andrew Collins, maybe. Uh, he he's been excavating that site, and it um, it's it relates directly back to around 2000 BC, so right about the time I think it's I think that's the date. It's not a it's a cosmic impact site. It's not a younger dry site, but it, it literally relates exactly to the Sodom and Gomorrah story uh, in the Bible about people being turned to pillars of salt, the earth getting salted, nothing growing there, and that's they found it and they found all this evidence for a cosmic airburst where again it melted people, it broke pottery. Like they, they're mapping out where the bits landed and how, how roasted they were and these stone and mud brick walls were just, you know, it's like vitrified, yeah, vitrified from like two, three thousand degree heat. And it, and it literally, it did something that nothing grew there for, for decades and decades afterwards. So it's, it really matches that story uh, as it's written in the, you know, raining fire and brimstone from the sky uh, in the Bible. So. Okay, so... And then the other vector that I always like to talk about is the advanced ancient artifacts, which we have seen many of these, and we will see more. Uh, there's the unfinished obelisk. These range in large from so uh, range in size from large to small, vases, statues, boxes, slabs, columns, particularly in Egypt, and that's what we're here to see. Uh, on this tour, we've seen a lot of these artifacts, and this is pretty much where I dive into the details, so I can stop here. Um, but we can get into machining, like I, I, I sort of classify this in terms of the artifacts as well as um, the machining, the evidence for machining that we see, and then also the evidence for precision uh, in these artifacts, measured precision, the bases, and the base scan project has obviously revealed a lot about that in uh, the last year or so. And then also I, I have another category where I kind of describe it as a real problem for these Bronze Age cultures, which is in the logistics, like these that thousand ton plus statue at the Ramesseum that we saw. I, 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 I think that would be a very challenging undertaking for a civilization like the Bronze Age Egyptians who, by all accounts, didn't use the wheel, they didn't use force multipliers, you know, they didn't use pulleys or capstans or anything like that. So with that, what do you guys want to do? Is there a Q&A or do you want me to get into the vases? Um, an update on the vases. Update on the vases? <gasps> yeah. Alright. And then, let's do that. Let me pull that up. So, I'll try. <laughs> Don't know how long this will take. I have a few. You guys should ask questions if you have a few. Yeah, yeah, Speaking stop me and ask questions. Yeah. And I, I will try to scoot through this. Try. Got to be here for three hours. Could be. <laughs> Could be. So, we all know the vases. We've seen a lot of these examples, right? They range in large. The vases, in particular, they're they're amazing set of artifacts that we know go way back in time. We'll talk about that. But they, we also saw in the museum how they range in size from very small. There's that, um, you know, that little tourmaline transparent tiny thing that's about the size of your thumb you know right up to uh to vases like this one that we saw that's you know half, you know hip height basically so they range in size and shape and there's plates and vessels they're not all just vases obviously the schist disc is one of those uh you have other ones that have this very high degree of corundum in them which is a nine on the most scale all different types of stone hardness shape form size but a lot of them seem to seem to at least to the eye to, to show remarkable aspects uh, of precision. So for example, this, I actually found this, we found this again. This had gone hiding for several years. This particular vase had gone hiding and it was up in a dusty, you couldn't, it was like on this alcove that you weren't supposed to get up to and they hid it in a dusty cabinet. But then they'd actually moved it again to I think the vase room. But this is one that I've always been impressed with because it, it's one of those eggshell, like it, it stands like it's on the tip of an egg. It's just amazing. And it's, it, you, you know, it's, it needs to be like symmetrical and balanced in order to do this. You can barely see it there. I've actually got some better photos of it, but you can just see how it's just perfectly balanced when, when it's and symmetrical. Like that, when it sits like that, is the top level? It's yes. So the top yeah, the top is level. So when these are sitting, the, the top is level. Yeah. Well, as level as we've been able to look at it. I mean, you start putting tools on them, it pushes them around. But, but I mean, it, to the eye, you sit down on it, it looks very level. Just remarkable manufacturing in hard stone. This is also another vase that we saw, and, and I think maybe since I started talking about this, they just rotated it a bit further around. But you used to be able to see in this vase, with these large crystal inclusions, 
it has a chunk missing out of the side of it here. And then if you look closely, and I, I zoomed in on it, you can see how thin that material is. It's, it's remarkable. And this is a very difficult type of stone to work with these large crystal inclusions. It goes from hard to soft. That's one of the challenges of using this type of stone as a medium for, for creating these sort of objects is that it's just not homogeneous material. It's like a stupid material, frankly, to try and make this stuff out of because you're going from hard to soft from different materials uh, in, the, in the aggregate of whatever the stone is. And it'd be much easier to do this from, you know, metals or any other sort of material like resin, anything like that, wood even, is much more homogeneous than a lot of these types of stone. But somehow they did manage to then, to create these things, not only, you know, with precision, balance, symmetry, but also very fine, uh, very fine and, and thin um, uh, thicknesses, I guess. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's... It's a, it's a mystery. It's, very, it's, it's quite an achievement, is what I'd say, when you look at this. And, and they get much thinner than this, as we'll see. But um, obviously, and this was obvious even to Flinders Petrie back in the day, they, they're obviously the product of, of turning, right? And this is a, one of those problems for the story of ancient Egypt, as we know it, because there's really no evidence that they developed uh, the wheel, let alone more advanced wheel applications, things like, like lathes until much later on, if, if ever, with the lathe. But certainly the wheel doesn't seem to have been around uh, until somewhere around 1600 BC is the date that I've heard. Uh, I've been recently reading some research on, on when did the pottery wheel come to, come to Egypt? Because as you'll see, and as we saw in the museum, these are often displayed next to very simple pottery vessels that are, they're not turned, they're just handmade. So they're pitched, you know, they, they've got a coil of, of of clay and they're, they're, they're making it in a circle. Uh, one of the early applications of the wheel might be there's some speculation that it could have been something turned by foot, but only to aid in the in the laying out of, of pinched pottery, it, to throw a vessel, to actually use centrifugal force to make a pot, like to make a pot like you do today on a potter's wheel. You have to spin that thing reasonably fast, right? It's got to actually provide that force to push the clay out, and that's a bit more advanced of a of a mechanism, but when you look at the vases, and these vases stretch way back into time, I mean the principle of rotating of, of some sort of turning mechanism is plainly obvious. It's written into the stone itself. There are all these fragments we see it in the vases. And Flinders Petrie found this as well when he was looking at, at all of his artifacts. And he said the principle of rotating the tool was for smaller objects abandoned in favor of rotating the work. So instead of a, a, a rotating tool, you're actually turning the work. And the lathe appears to have been as, as familiar an instrument in the 4th dynasty as it is in modern workshops. The diorite bowls and vases of the Old Kingdom are frequently met with and show great technical skill. And in fact, this picture here is from one of Petrie's publications. And this exact piece is then also now being examined by Christopher Dunn in his book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. He's looking at Petrie's pieces and showing you the exact same uh, fragments and, and turning marks, these witness marks from some form of turning process. So clearly whoever made these was using a turning process. There's no, there's no doubt. Yeah, I just want to... The, the thing that's important about this to me, like I've, we've seen people online saying, well, these are obviously, they, you know, they're made with a lathe. You can make this with a lathe. The difficult thing about a lathe when you're cutting stone is the rigidity of the axis that you're rotating the work with. And I mean, you could, you could imagine making a lathe out of some wood and spinning some wood inside another piece of wood and you can, yeah, you can make that. But it won't be rigid enough because when you have to put the force against the stone, it's gonna create, it's gonna push that axis against whatever bearing it is if you're just rolling it inside of another piece of wood. And so you're gonna, you're gonna, sort of cut an oval into the, sh into the, essentially the bearing or the bushing, because it's a soft material. In order to make a vase like this, you have to have a very rigid bearing. And it, <coughs> however long it takes to grind it or cut it or whatever, even if you use like sort of simple grinding tools, that turning, in order for the vase to be symmetrical, has to have a rigid bearing. That is the complexity, in my opinion, of making a lathe is getting that precision. We have lathes today that are, you know, machine grade, like like for making very precise objects, and they're humongous. The 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 bearings in there are precision made, and that that precision to make that bearing 
relies on an entire development of precision from a flat surface. And it, it, it moves out in stages of more complexity. And so it's just, it's, it's not enough to say they had a lathe to make these. The bearing would be the most difficult aspect of it. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a, I know we get into this, uh, if you watch some of the base scan podcasts with the machinists and metrologists that uh, Alex and Nick and also Adam, we talk about the, the requirements for lays and things. Uh, before I move on to, if anyone here wants to, Mo is here before we leave. You don't have to do it now, but just make sure you, you if you haven't already and you want to go to either Abu Simbel, all these special permissions that we've talked about, just make sure you he's here and you can write your name down. If you haven't messaged him or whatever, but yeah, just do it before. You don't have to do it now, but before uh, before you leave the room, when we're done. Uh, so yeah, not only were they turned, but as we mentioned before, um, fantastically thin. And uh, one of the I like this example. You see some examples here uh, of thin ones. We've seen a couple of them. Uh, you've probably seen them in the the base cam video. I think we had one base that got down to a couple of millimeters uh, in terms of thickness, but Petrie actually found one that I think is astonishing. I think it's in the Petrie Museum. I hope to see it one day, but he said, but the greatest triumph is a bowl of diorite, translucent and full of minute flaws, which must render it very brittle. Yet this bowl, six inches diameter, is only one fortieth of an inch thick over its greatest part. Just around the edge, it is thicker in order to strengthen it, but a small chip broken out of the body of it shows its extraordinary thinness, no stouter than thin card. That's... Wow. In, insane. <laughs> That's insane. Is that the piece on the left? No. No, it's in the Petri Museum. I haven't seen it, but this is one of those. This is actually calcite that's machined out and it has these ridges on it. Very. It's also very thin and translucent. The vase, one of uh, Matt Bell's vases, is, is also very thin and translucent granite. But this is kind of mind-blowing to me that you can get diorite down to this thin and still make a vessel out of it. And not only that, we saw beneath the step pyramid, it's, it's consistent. Like it's not like the, the, the thickness of the material wavers. You can see the tapering where it goes from thick to thin. That's consistent and it's maintaining that, it's, it's losing that thickness along a fixed diameter or you know, a fixed curve. And it, they do it very consistently, so it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. But. So as we know, 40,000 of these were, developed, were discovered beneath the step pyramid. 40,000 to 50,000 is the number I often hear. This is a picture from Jean-Philippe Loyer's uh, excavation, lots of broken shards. The tomb robbers down here were probably smashing them to see if there was anything in them, and obviously some of them were a bit too hard to, to break. So we have lots of shards of them and, and a lot of whole ones that are mostly all in the museum these days. I think we saw this piece down there. It's still there, I hope. Uh, some of these were inscribed, as we talked about, and Yusuf makes the joke now that since we've been talking about this over the last few years, they've been removing the poorly inscribed vessels and pieces of vessels, and they're only leaving the best ones on display. But this is from Jean-Philippe Loyer's uh, diagrams and, and pictures as well. And you can see how rough these inscriptions are, right? Common theme. We know that some of these inscriptions were done purely with hammer and chisels. We saw this piece, in fact, in the Saqqara, the Imhotep Museum. But yeah, this is, this is how they're dated too, right? So because they're inscribed and they have the names of first and second dynasty kings on them, that's obviously who made them, never mind that the, you know, it's, it's such a poor inscription relative to the, the vessel itself. And we ran through this in the Imhotep Museum, but I, I do like the fact that they're forced to acknowledge that these are, in fact, heirlooms from an earlier time because of these inscriptions. So we, we talked about this in the museum, but it's, they, they say that, you know, this, the art of carving stone vessels was, uh, was, a, was an art that reached its peak during the first two dynasties and all the types of stone found in Egypt were used. And they also say that many of these were heirlooms from dating from dynasties one and two, and it is thought that Joseph had them buried under his pyramid after they were recovered from earlier tombs. And I just, I, I, I like this because it's, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that they were out there taking these things from earlier tombs. They kind of ignore the fact that we also find these in these pre-dynastic burials that go back for thousands of years before the dynastic Egyptians. But because the majority of these were found under there, like, well, yeah, maybe he was robbing some tombs, but. This, this concept of inheritance is now, it's out there, right? And I think that's what we're looking at. These artifacts are probably much older than this, and they've probably been inherited many times. You can imagine a rich collector today deciding that when he dies and builds his mausoleum, he wants to get buried with the, his treasures, and he's got a few of these ancient Egyptian vases, and then our civilization ends, and in 7,000 years, the archaeologists of the future dig him up, and they find him with these vases. 
are they all going to just assume he had them made? I mean, I, I really think we could be looking at a similar picture to that. They could already be thousands of years old. Yeah, we're going to find Adam with his face. <laughs> and they do, in fact, stretch far back into time, these out of place artifacts. We saw the lapis tube next to the bone and bead ornaments. We saw from the pre dynastic times these machine obsidian gourds or rock crystal gourds. And obsidian's not a, you know, that mostly obsidian gets worked by flaking and chipping because it chips off and forms these nice sharp edges. But machining this requires rotational tools and, and, and you know, the, much more sophistication to get this shape out of obsidian than just by banging on it with rocks and sticks, which is how they say they were done. The oldest site that I know of that seems to show seems to show evidence for uh, for for vases and stone vases uh, is one called Toshka. It dates back on carbon fourteen to fourteen thousand five hundred years old. Uh, some people have been saying, well, this that there isn't they didn't find anything at Toshka. I mean, there are vases. It's a primitive burial. You can see here there is pottery vases. What might be stone vases. It, it, I use this as an example uh, to just to show that these types of primitive burials that ran right up until they started changing their practices in the early, um, you know, the, the archaic times before the, the um, Egyptian civilization, lots of those burials also found, we found some of these hard stone vases. In fact, Adam has one of these vases that was brought out of Egypt by, uh, I think the Czechoslovakian ambassador in the 1930s, it has impeccable provenance and it was found in a site that was dated back to nine or 10,000 years uh, ago or nine or 10,000 BC. So for sure, and it, it's undoubted and you, you'll see it in the museums everywhere. We know they're found in pre-dynastic burials. We just, we just don't know how far back they go. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is just interesting to me, but in this cabinet here with the, with the uh, the little gourds, obsidian and rock crystal. There are flint artifacts, and the one on the top left there is a striking resemblance yep. to the arrowheads or the flint tools found at the lowest levels of Gobekli Tepe, called the PPNA people, 12,000 years old. It looks exactly like the same work that they do. So I just found that interesting in the museum that they, they group these things together. Yeah, I mean, they, they, and that's, you know, we see it in this example. So I love this. I showed you guys this, one of my favorites, and you see this everywhere, where it, because they're found in the same burial with the, you know, the beads and the bone and the flint, they're always displayed in there like, look what these people did. And it's just, I, I, I couldn't, this is a clear-cut case of imitation to me like you have this machine stone vessel you want a coffee too yeah yeah russ needs a coffee please uh american coffee black coffee uh, cappuccino. cappuccino yes cappuccino two yeah two please yeah. three cappuccinos thank you. <laughs> <laughs> while you're while you're up thank you um so hard stone vessel shows all these signs of advanced machining handmade primitive clay pottery vessel, handmade, not turned, and then painted to look like granite. Like, I don't know, It's that's imitation, right? If you're in the business of making this thing, and you're in the business of making pottery for whatever purpose you want the pottery for, to hold water or something else, and you find something like this, I mean, your mind is blown. Like, you, you would know, you're playing with rocks and stuff anyway, and you just, you find a vessel like that, and you're like, how did they do this? It would immediately become precious. It would immediately become something that's like from the gods. You ever seen the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy? <laughs> Similar to the Coke bottle. Ancient Coke bottle. Right? <laughs> like now this, is, this belongs to the important people and we're going to imitate it and sell these. You know? So, and, and this concept of imitating stone I found in the British Museum is actually um, also explained creatively uh, by the, um, the mainstream kind of standard model establishment. And, uh, and, and I often like this, I've probably said this to a few of you at, at various times as well. When they get to something that they can't quite explain, it's, that's when we start to evoke magic. Right? It's, it, and the same thing happens here. And they say, this is in the British Museum, where you see the, the, the swirls are there to imitate porphyry swirls of some of the, the, the porphyry uh, vases. But you know, vessels laboriously carved from hard stone were very expensive and held ores or ornaments that were probably even more valuable. 
I'm not sure if you look at the price of the vase these days. An imitation could magically supply both the container and its contents for the afterlife. Here, the pot's spiral decoration mimics the limestone breccia, sorry, breccia, of the jar. The, way, the wavy lines pointed on the handles evoked a shimmer of, of gold foil, which was added to the most lavish stone container. So they're just saying these are the budget versions of vases. That's why they did them, and that's why they tried to make them look like the hardstone vases. But magically, they could supply the same thing, because, of course, all of these things are just ceremonial and tools for the afterlife. And it's also pointed out from uh, Barakat, who's the, I think one of the largest antiquities dealers, uh, which are certainly a lot of Matt, uh, Matt Bell's vases have come from, but he says here that it is interesting to observe that the ancient Egyptian artisans were sculpting vessels in stone in large quantities well before they were creating stone sculpture. And this is a really interesting point, because if you go back and you say, well, okay, the archaic period, the first and second dynasties, and even pre-dynastic times, that they were responsible for making these stone vessels we literally see that, that stonework in nothing else. It's not in their architecture. There aren't statues. There aren't other artifacts that, that reflect this degree of sophistication in stoneworking anywhere else. There's a bit more of a problem later in dynastic Egypt, right? They got very sophisticated with their stonework. And it's one of the re this is why I think the vases are so important. It's because these are small objects that can be buried with you. And they obviously were. So we're finding them in burials where you can't say this is a new kingdom burial. Like if it's an archaic age or a pre-dynastic burial. We're finding these artifacts in them. And that's, we know it was, it's dated to at least that period, right? It, it's at least that, that old. It, it can't be younger because everything else matches that period and it's carbon dated or whatever. And then it seems like Joseph in particular went out and got as many of these things as he could. And he put them under his pyramid, and there's obviously a few more that were found because we see these stretching out through the through the Joseph was third dynasty, but Petrie also found them in the fourth dynasty sites like at Giza. But after that, they just disappear, right? And we're gonna we'll talk about the the alabaster industry that sprung up after it. But the fact that they disappear, it's like this tech, technology just disappears. It's that's that's really key because you see the same technology in later artifacts, right? You see it in stuff that's dated to later periods, the statues, the slabs, the boxes, but all these other artifacts are large, they're massive. You can't get buried with a giant, you know, thousand ton statue. You can't get bur buried with a hundred ton box. You can't take it with you. These things were stuck on these sites. The sites were occupied continuously, renovated, reused, rebuilt. And then eventually some pharaoh gets arrogant and enough and develops enough hubris to put his name on it. And now, today, we're interpreting that as, well, he must have built it. I think if you can connect the vases and that, that, so Yusuf always talks about the technology of the pyramid builders. If you can connect the vases to these other artifacts and the fact that the vases disappear and that they're dated way back here, I think the same case can be made for some of these other artifacts that show that sign of precision. That's, it's really why I think these vases are so important. And, and what's being uncovered with the vase scan uh, project is important. Okay, so are they canopic jars? No, we saw plenty of canopic jars with um, nice lids that were made from alabaster. These are the lids we saw in the museum. You'd think if you could make the vase, you'd make a lid, but when the ones that were used for canopic purposes, they had mud lids like this. Uh, we went through this in the Imhotep Museum, the standard model explanation for them. It's that one scene on the wall where you have a bent stick with weights and they're rotating and drilling and they're rubbing on stuff with rocks and sand and polishing them up. And this is the blanket explanation that gets used on for how all of the vases were made. And then I think what they're showing you is this tale of two industries, the other industry of vase making that popped up. And we, we've been over this in Saqqara, and that is the industry of alabaster vase making. Much softer stone, much easier to work than the granites and the, uh, the platonic stones, uh, and also does not show the same sign of precision, symmetry, balance, all those things. A close look at all of these, you can see they're kind of rough. They're, I mean, it became, they're beautiful pieces of art, wonderful creations of a... Uh, of, of, of the people who made them, but they're not just not the same thing. They're not, you know, they're wavy on top. They're not balanced. They're not symmetrical. You saw underneath the step pyramid, and I've got to add a slide in here that shows it. Those alabaster vases next to the precision shards. I love that that demonstration. We dug all that stuff off. It's two industries. And then we talk about this. These vases disappear after the old kingdom, and then we get into the vase cancer. So what's happened recently? And I'll skip right through this because I think I think. Uh, you guys should know, I mean, I hope you know what's happened with the, the first vase. This is actually Adam's vase right here. 
uh, and this was the first one that really started this. Like this was a phase was structured using modern technology. I was absolutely thrilled when Chris Dunn called me and told me what Alex and Adam were doing. And I talked to Alex because it's like I've been saying in videos for years that we really should be applying our technology to analyze these things and to try and figure out what we can learn about them. And that's exactly what happened. And Adam's been the driving force behind that, um, that effort for years now. And it finally got done. It was analyzed using a structured light scanner, which gets you, you know, precision down to around a thousandth of an inch. And then that, soft, that, that result or that model was analyzed in CMM software or coordinate measuring machine software by metrologists, uh, Alex Dunn and uh, Nick Sierra, Alex being Chris Dunn's son. These guys work making precision machine parts, you know, for jet engines and aerospace industry. So they, they really, this is what they do. Um, how many dozen got scanned? How many we got scanned? Uh, I mean, well, you have like 500 plus scans, but they're not. How many? About five, six hundred. Yeah. But they're yeah. not all. Yeah, not all. I mean, I know Matt Bell's had at least 15 vases scanned now. He's getting them scanned, so he's he's scanning them in a CT. He's using CT X-ray, which is micron level precision. Um, in fact, I got an email from him the other day. I'll be chatting to him when I get home. But a lot's now, and that's this. This is the update. This is this is kind of where I want to go with this because I'm not sure you've seen. We talked about. I talked a lot about the first phase. Talked about it on Rogan and in, in these presentations. Uh, but what's interesting is in the mass and what we found in these subsequent couple of phases that we have, that that has been scanned and analysed because it's it's one thing to define the precision and the metrology of the vase. It's a whole other effort to actually then do the analysis work to try and uncover the mass, which is what happened. But I'll do my best to skip through this quickly. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so you, in order to do this, you have this, this like a 3D model of the base, and it's generated by a point cloud system that's just, think of it as just millions and millions and millions of little dots and points of reference, right, that make up this model. So you have to establish like a reference frame for measurement. So you basically build up this XYZ three-dimensional reference frame and coordinate system that now lets you, you know, basically measure everything and put everything into relative position next to each other. Uh, and again, the vase is an ellipsoid, right? So it's not a geometric shape. You, you can do geometry on spheres, cones, cylinders, flat planes, you know, that's geometric operations. You can't do it to an ellipsoid because it doesn't match any of those shapes. So what you do is you go and you map geometric shapes to sections of the vase you do a best fit, okay? So if you get as a section of the vase or where it curves, it might match a sphere or there's the handles, the lug handles might match a cylinder. It's not all of the lug handle matches it. You wanna find the best fit with the most points for that, for that cylinder to match to the vase. And then you do your geometric operations based on that cylinder. Now you could do this and sometimes this happens in modern machines. So this is a standard, industry standard technique too for doing this sort of precision analysis with machine parts. You could match it with five points, right? You could get a sphere and match it to the body of the vase with five points. It's not gonna be a very accurate representation of that part of the vase with just five points, but you'll be able to do spherical geometry on it. But if you use like 10,000 points or 80,000 points, it's gonna be a much, much better fit. So the more points you use, the better fit and the better representation of the actual object what you get in the geometry. So. It's important to note, um, and you'll see the number of points of reference that have been used to match these safe shapes here. But once you do that, you can do a couple of things. You can compare geometric form accuracy. So how spherical is this part of it? You know, how perfectly round is this part of it? How flat is the plane? And you can also then map out the relative accuracy from different parts of things. So I can say, I'm gonna measure everything relative to the top surface of the vase. So now I can see how perpendicular is it? How parallel is it? And that's where the, that's where the true sophistication and complexity of these single piece artifacts comes out. It's, it's, in the relative, it's in the relative geometry of the different faces. So think of it like this, in it's a box in the Serapium or at the Lahoon box or something. How, how parallel are those end walls apart from each other? You know, how square, how, how, how perpendicular are the sidewalls relative to each other? It's not just a matter of like how good does the corner look or how flat is the surface. It's this relative geometry. And Petrie knew this too when he was looking at things like the Lahoon box. Because once you, if you're carving this from a single piece, 
once you stuff up, you can't just remove more material to fix an error. So it's, it, it truly shows you just how accurate and sophisticated they were when you see this extremely accurate relative geometry. And that's kind of what you get to with this vase. So it starts with the top surface. So you want to develop these reference surfaces that you can then measure against everything else against. And we start with the flat plane on the top of the lip, right? It's a flat, it's a, it's a flat plane on the, flat, on, on the top of the vase lip. It uses nearly 4,000 points of reference to match a plane. Uh, it has a run out or bear, not run out, but a variation from that flat plane of three thousandths of an inch. So it's three thousandths of an inch off being like perfectly flat. And that then gives us reference surface A. So think of it as this horizontal line that now we can measure everything else against. And for reference, that what, does, what is three thousandths of an inch? Well, right here you can see a precision caliper uh, being used to measure a sheet of printer paper and it's somewhere between two and three thousandths of an inch thick. So, no, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's, sorry, it's more, it's more than that. It's, uh, this looks like between four and five. I think a human hair is between two and three thousandths thick. But a sheet of printed paper here, a thin, thin sheet's just under five thousandths uh, thick. So this is roughly, that flat plane is off by about the thickness of a human hair. So you continue from there, right? So a cylinder is mapped to the vase mouth. You can see the blue parts where it's mapped. It was using uh, nearly 11,000 points of reference. Although it's damaged, and you can see the damage in the scan here, the cylindricity of it, so how, how well does it match that cylinder is within 13 thousandths of an inch. And what's astonishing about this is once you have a cylinder, you obviously got a center line for that cylinder, a vertical axis. And you can now, you can say, well, we've got that top axis. How perpendicular is that vertical axis to the top axis? So how well did they make this relative, or how flat did they make it relative to the center line? And it's within one thousandth of an inch. So this is astonishing. Like this is, this is, it's almost, it's basically perfectly perpendicular to the top, the top plane. Over what? The margin of error. Yeah, the margin of error is very, very small. Over what? Distance? Well, the vase mouth. Well, it's measured, so the cylinder maps from about here to here in the vase neck. So using that cylinder and that vertical line, we're now establishing basically a vertical axis, right? So now we have, we've now got a center line for the base. We've got a top plane and a center line. And you can measure everything against it. And this, this gets really interesting because you have a, a sphere that got matched to the bottom. You can actually see these symbols here. It shows you a sphere that's matched to here. So with a sphere, you can look at, you can look at well, where's the center point of the sphere? And this is one of the larger numbers we saw. It's, it's like nearly 80,000 points of reference to match this sphere. You can see it'd be a very big sphere, right? Huge sphere, that you match a portion of it to this. But it's using nearly 80,000 points of reference. So it's a very accurate representation of the base body. And its, it's, it's center line or its center point is within 17 thousandths of an inch uh, off the center line of the base. And this is the biggest number we had, but it's still... Nick makes a really good point of, of, of saying how actually remarkable this is because what it's also telling you is that it is almost perfectly spherical. So with spherical geometry, if you squeeze one side of the sphere or you move it around, it, it really affects where that center point is. So not only is it pretty damn close to the center line for the vase, it's also basically almost perfectly um, spherical, this section of the vase body. Um, yeah, it just shows you this consistency of how, of how perfect that work is around the vase body. Uh, and then the other end of the vase, same thing in the vase bottom. Uh, we can match a cone to these sections of the vase bottom using 60,000 uh, points of reference. Uh, we can measure its parallelism uh, to the center line within nine thousandths of an inch. We can measure its perpendicularity to the top plane. That's within five thousandths of an inch, and that's an interesting measurement because you're measuring something at the bottom end of the vase and the top plane's at the top, so you're still within five thousandths of an inch across that difference. And just so you know, these numbers, again, relative to the width of a human hair. I mean, these are tolerances that are really only hit with some of the, you know, you have to you have to be very deliberate about trying to hit precision to this level. Like machine parts in an engine, the rotating parts and the, the parts that are touching each other, you might be talking about a couple of foul uh, of, of, of precision uh, in making those parts, but the other parts in an engine, it, it's not going to be, you're not going to make them that accurately because you don't need to, be 20 or 30 foul. Uh, but we're just, we're seeing parts here that are blowing the minds of kind of like aerospace manufacturing engineers <laughs> that are seeing this like, what the hell is this? And if you, when we analyzed, we analyzed other vases that would have been made, like modern marble vases, and they're not really anything even close. Like it's just, 
yeah, it, these, these numbers, you wouldn't expect to see these sort of numbers, and you're certainly never going to hit these sort of numbers building anything by hand. And that, that's kind of the challenge, what we're trying to show with this is, you'll never get, this is, to, to, to suggest this was made by someone rubbing on it with sticks and rocks and sand is outrageous at this point. On this bottom, on that last slide, on the bottom, yeah. So is the bottom convex or concave? It's flat bottom, didn't it, Adam? No? Well, it's a radius. Every surface has a radius. Every surface has a radius. So, so if it's convex, then is it like, it looks like it's octagonal? Probably concave. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that is. It's, don't they spin? They all spin so to one degree or the other. Convex. Yeah, convex. convex. Yeah. yeah, even the flat, the ones that seem to be flat bottom will still sort of spin on a flat surface. Yeah. I just wonder if that like octagonal. So the lug handles get very interesting when you consider the, the manufacturing of the vessels. And I know we've talked about this. Like you can imagine a vessel without lug handles being made on a lathe. Like it's turning and you can make that shape on a lathe. The lug handles make that a lot more uh, difficult. And we and the, the guys measured the, uh, the lug handles. They match cylinders to the lug handles, although probably a torrid would have been a better fit but we can match a cylinder to them with slightly over around 4,000 points for each of them and they turned out to be astonishingly accurate relative to the reference surfaces the the center line and the base at the top of the base within what have we got one and three thousandths of an inch and then uh, they're also very relative to each other so one of them we determined you can make it uh, reference surface F and then compare the other one to an and its cylinder is perfectly parallel to within, I think, seven thousandths of an inch on this screen. So these are on other sides of the face from each other. And the issue with the vase handles is, is how do you make them on a lathe? It's, it's, you would have to create a bull nose, right, that runs all the way around this thing. And then you have to go and you'd have to change your process. You'd have to take it out, change a different tool, different process, and remove this area of the vase body between the handles. And in our systems of manufacturing, when we do that, you, you lose this positional calibration of having the tool in one, you know, one machine on one, you've mounted one way, and you, you, you get a lack of accuracy. You get, a, you get a drop in precision when you change that tooling in that process. Hello, Chris. You got an answer. Yeah. Yeah. You can do this removal between these two create the surface that matches the rest of the turn surface without letting go of it. Okay. So you're turning, you're so, turning partial surface. Yeah, so Chris is saying you can do this yeah. without letting go of it by turning, basically instead of it continually spinning, turning turning in partial circles. Yeah. Oscillation and yeah. yeah, oscillation back and forth. Yeah, I mean, I can see how that would work too. Um, but there is clean up when you get really close to you. You've got to get clean up. There's going to be cleanup because you can't get the tool all the way, right the way to it. Right, and and remember that's the interesting because we see that both directions, and you do see cleanup on just about everything. So that that's really interesting. I mean, just we're diverting a little bit here, but but when we went to Danville, we measured these and we got the 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 dial indicators real close mm -hmm. to these lug handles. You definitely see it bump up like this cleanup. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. Awesome. That is awesome. But, yeah. So maybe that's an answer because. If you were to just to do this on a lathe and you came back with a different process, you know, you'd, you'd lose that positional calibration. My point is that even in modern manufacturing, that's accounted for and you would see it. But when we scanned it, when we scanned it, there's really no perceivable lack of precision on that area of the base body, right? So 20,000 points of reference matching uh, a, a circle or a, um, a torah to or a sphere to it. Uh, it's still within five thousandths of an inch, yes. So Chris, if you did this, yeah. if you cut that bull nose, but you had already cut the rest of the, the curvature of the base body, yeah. and you come back to do that cleanup, you still have to match that curvature so that it's consistent with the rest of the base body. So it, could you do this hand guided, like you're, you're guiding the, you're controlling it by hand? Because well, it seems like you, if you, you would have to know all the different points of reference along that curvature. Well, it's 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 kind of uh, cut and test. So if you have a gauge that's got that curve on it, and you lay it up against there, you just take what's high off. 
Okay, so you, you, so you, can, you, you can make a gauge yes. to guide you to... So I think a lot the of these shapes could be done on these things by hand if you had a test gauge to put up next to it. But if you have a tool that's able to do all that, you have a cleanup tool that may be more precise. Isn't yeah, tool, tool changing still. I mean, it's less tool changing, more like letting go and mounting it differently. Yeah. You said that you don't have duplicates. So <coughs> We don't well. We don't know that we that we have duplicates yet. Okay. We we need to expand the data set to figure that out. But theoretically, if there are none, you're creating a gauge every time. Every time. Every time. Yeah. Every yeah. single time. And it has well, to be precise. It has to be precise, and this gets more interesting because it, they're very specific radiuses, yeah. and they are all mathematically interrelated, which is which is where we go from here, which is kind of deeper down the rabbit hole with these vases. Because what happened, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what happened was, and I, 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 massive thank you to Adam, primarily for allowing the scan of his vase to be released to the public. Because we open sourced it, I put it out on the website, and we did the videos, and people got interested. And this is the power of kind of that, that crowdsourcing for information, but it turns out there was a cryptographer in Denmark who was not at all interested in pyramids, that saw the video, but he's a machinist and he's a, he's a polymath, he's a genius, genius actually, Mark Vist. Uh, he runs a website, unsigned.io. He undertook a, a deep mathematical and geometric analysis of the model. He poured in a, several hundred hours into this and uh, his findings are, I think, yeah, nothing sort of revolutionary in terms of what he dug out of it. And it couldn't have happened without him, so, and it wouldn't have happened if Adam wouldn't, wasn't willing to release the, the base file out for like open sourcing, which is, just proved to have some wonderful results. Okay. So, a couple of things here that you can see. I mean, I just want to point these out because we come back to them. There are spheres that you can define based on the maximum external diameter of the vase and also the maximum internal diameter of the vase. So just sort of remember those because we'll come back to those. But um, what Mark worked out by analyzing this um, this vase is that is that there everything's curved. Everything has a radius. All of the parts of this vase is is essentially a portion of a circle. So the most widely used primitive or the, the geometric shape in the vase is a circle. And then you have arcs of circles that are used to define all of the features of the vase. Now, once he measured all of these and he started to determine these, these arcs and these circles, you can see the tiny detail in the lip here, like even this tiny curvature here, it just has an arc. It's not like a straight line, it has an arc that matches a circle. There's two little circles that define the arcs that you see on the top lip. The handles have an arc, the base of the vase has arcs of circles, there's the interior circle, the exterior circle, circles, all about circles. <laughs> but what he figured out, once, he's, once he mapped out the radii of these circles, he found that these radii have a fixed ratio with each other. As in, it's only circles of these particular size, these, the radii of these circles have a fixed ratio with each other that can be expressed by a single elegant scalar function which is the radius of that particular circle equal, well, you start with one circle, right? You have a base or a radius of zero, you have a zero point circle you start with. But the radius of every other circle in there can be expressed by this algorithm of the square root of six over two to the power of n. So one, two, three, four, minus one, minus two, minus three, up, up and down. And the vase is almost entirely made, almost entirely, not completely, but almost entirely made from curves and radii that fit this, what's called the radial traversal pattern which is remarkable and this sort of explains it a little bit so you have all of these circles that scale up from 42 millimeters at the top end down to 1.1 millimeters at the at the small end so that's a that's a tiny circle try drawing a circle with and drawing it accurately <laughs> with a radius of 1.1 millimeter it's difficult and they scale up and down right so you have these range of circles there's like 12 or 13 of them and what he did is like, well, okay, so now I've got this mathematical function that matches these circles that are used on this vase, which means I can now define the vase based with uh, based just mathematically. Like I can I can define everything mathematically. <coughs> and he thought I'm going to go into CAD, computer aided design, and I'm going to create a model of a vase using just the math. Like the math I've decoded from it, I'm going to make a vase just using the maths of, of these circles, not the, not the actual base, he's making a model. And then he compared 
he compared this the uh, the mathematical model to the scan model, and this is this was amazing when he when I read this and figured it out like uh, you know three or four times later once I realized what he was saying. Uh, that the medial radial deviation from the CAD model for all circles was nine microns. So less, like like about a third of a thousandth of an inch. So that's the average deviation in in the radius from, uh, in the radio of these circles from the actual vase scan to the, the mathematical model. So it's nearly, basically perfectly executed. So not only does it look like it was designed mathematically, but it was then also executed with astonishing precision. And at that level, I mean, we don't know if we're dealing with inaccuracies in the vase scan because you're at the limit of kind of the resolution of the scan or it could just be minute damage to the vase over time because it, it's an ancient artifact that has a little bit of surface damage on it here and there. And just and malleability. the and malleability, right? Or temperature even. Yeah. So the idea that you have these completely consistent microscopic precision, precision that's implemented across 12 different radii with fixed wow. ratios in granite it's an unfathomable achievement. Like this is, you have 12, you, you can, like we can argue that you can discover a pattern in almost anything, but when you have 12 levels of mathematical interrelationship like this, it's not an accident. I think Mark, in the article, he says it would be far more likely for you to wake up one morning and find that there's a new quantum universe has sprouted out of your left nostril. Right? And I think he's right. Like it's, 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 it's an amazing achievement. This was like, what the hell are we finding here? And uh, yeah, it's happened to you twice, <laughs> has it? No, no, no. Quantum <laughs> Universe Russ over here. <laughs> so where they started to, it's just like where they got started just to show you that it also reflects these, this, the flower of life patterns, these interlocked kind of sacred geometry patterns that are on here. This looks complicated, it's really not, but it is kind of fundamental to some of the other uh, design aspects of the vase that we see. There's two grids, two grids here, a red grid and a blue grid. The blue grid's based on the internal circle, so the maximum internal diameter, right? And you can actually see that based on this, 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 this diameter of this circle here, it actually also defines the vase top at A. The intersection of these lines define the vase bottom at E. Uh, and then you have another, uh, the red grid is actually defined by this circle here, that's the, the maximum external diameter. And then the intersection of these overlocking grids will help you to define all the other parts of the vase, basically, right? So, so the, the top width of it, the placement of the lug handles, things like this. So there's this, this sacred geometry that seems to be uh, encoding in it. And what that, lead, what that led Mark to concluding was that it seems like this vase was designed. So it wasn't just sort of randomly made by craftsmen sitting on a lathe or, or whatever tool he was using or rubbing on it and making it. This was designed you know, somehow and probably expressed and designed mathematically. And then that design was executed with remarkable precision in a manufacturing system, uh, some sort of manufacturing system. So one of the other fundamental concepts of this vase is the use of the one radian arc. Uh, radians, if you don't know what they are, you can follow this diagram. It's a really simple way of expressing angles, a bit more elegant than our sort of 360 degree uh, uh, system that we use today. You basically take the radius of a circle, you take the distance of that, you lay it onto the circumference of a circle. The angle that it makes is one radian. So there's two, there's 3.14 or pi radians in half a circle, and then there are two pi radians uh, in the in the diameter or, or the circumference of a whole circle, right? So you can express angles in terms of radians, which is also a reflection of pi, right? Because pi is this fundamental part of, of that circle geometry. But what we find in the vase is that the one radian arc has been used to define several of its features. So using that internal circle uh, up here at the at these matching it to these points B and the vase top, this the angle of the outside of the vase is actually forms a perfect one um, one radian degree arc. And then also this internal circle here, it's a one radian arc uh, in terms of. Um, the placement of the lug handle. So we see the use of a run, one radian, like it's spherical, it's just, it's, it's an example of the depth of mathematical and geometric knowledge that's encoded into these vases, I think. And it's a unit, it's a unit of measurement. So when Mark's doing this, where it was, I think he's starting to uncover the building blocks and the, the mechanisms and mathematics that are sitting behind the design of the vase. So we, I, as I said before, not all of the vases expressed by that radial traversal pattern. There are other measurements in the vase 
that don't match that pattern, but they do match something else, and that is they encode other significant uh, measurements, things like pi, and we talk about pi 3.141816 or whatever it is, and then they also show phi, the golden ratio. Does everybody know what the golden ratio is? One point one was it one point six one eight? So it's the it's it's the it's basically how the universe expresses itself. This ratio, right? It's the length of your upper arm to your lower arm. It's, it's expressed in the famous conch shell. Uh, it's the uh, the Fibonacci sequence. It's it's expressed in all life, and it, it it's ex you can find it in the cross section of DNA molecules, and you can find it in the formation of spiral galaxies. It scales up and down, cyclones, hurricanes. It all conforms to this golden ratio. Life, flowers, organic life, matter itself seems to organize itself in, in terms of the golden ratio. Our bodies are built on it. We're, we're perfect examples of the golden ratio in about a thousand different ways. And understanding this, it seems to show a, de a depth of understanding of how the universe and, and, the, and the world works, right? Just how reality works. And we find the golden ratio and pi. By the way, pi was not even supposed to have been discovered 5,000 years ago. The, the Greeks, of course, get the credit for pi. As with a lot of things the Greeks did, they, they probably got it from the Egyptians in the first place. But we see that in, in, um, in this vase. So I'm going to step through this. I'll try and do it quickly, but it's, it is fairly straightforward. But we see pi in a couple different places and the golden ratio. So you can see the math here. So the diameter of the opening... So it's the this red line here, the diameter of the vase opening over the radius of the internal uh, lip, that equals pi. And it equals pi to within 0.1% or approximately 32 microns, so accurate, pretty accurate. And there's another way, then we can also see uh, phi, right? So we can see phi when we look at the diameter of the neck, so this red line at the bottom here, over the radius of the opening, so the same ri, like the radius of the, radius of the internal opening, that equals phi squared to within 0.07%. So, you know, less, point, less than 0.1 of a percent, approximately 20, 20 uh, microns. We also find uh, the golden ratio in the, in, the, in the radius of the foot, right? So this is the other end of the base. This is, and this is kind of interesting because the same DO, that diameter of the opening, right? This, this line up here, the DO, same DO here. So we take the diameter of the opening and we put that over the radius of the foot and you also get phi squared within 0.08% or roughly 35, uh, 35 microns. And this, there's a little bit of math here, but it's reasonably easy to follow. But because DO on that first equation is already produced by pi, so we saw this here, right? If you go back, you see DO is already produced by pi. You can just write that equation a different way. So another way of writing the radius of the foot, because DO is involved in the radius of the foot, you can express the radius of the foot as the radius of the internal opening times pi over phi squared. And this is like a double equivalence that lets us, we've now got one measure that expresses both pi and phi and we can use it as a relationship to the other measurements that we've just looked at, which if you express it all like this, it gets, this, it leads somewhere interesting, trust me. So just follow me. So the diameter of the opening equals the radius of the internal opening times pi and the diameter of the neck equals the radius of the internal opening times pi, pi, uh, pi squared, and the radius of the foot equals the radius of the internal opening times pi over phi squared. So, what's the common element in this, right? We've got ri. We've got an ri. The radius of that internal opening is, is expressed in all those equations. So if we just assume that ri equals one, right, we just take away the ri, it gets a little bit more, more, more simplified. So if ri equals one, we can now read this as the diameter of the opening equals pi. The diameter of the neck equals phi squared, and the radius of the foot equals pi over phi squared. Therefore, the radius of the, inter of the internal opening might in fact be one, which means that might be their base unit of measurement for how they created this phase. Yeah? So what is it? So what's the actual measurement for one U, the radius of the internal opening? 18.739 millimeters. Interesting number because it happens to, and it may be a coincidence, but it happens to almost, it, it precisely matches the exact frequency of a 16 gigahertz uh, light wave or, or radio wave uh, traveling in a vacuum. So 16 gigahertz exactly. 
And that's an interesting frequency. We use it for a lot of satellite communications. I don't know, do you guys have comment on this? I don't know if you've talked much about this, but there's, this was interesting because it's not like 16.1 or 16 anything. It's like exactly 16 gigahertz is the same too. With two within two, two, uh, two microns. So set point 18.737 here. This is 18.739. So very, very close. Well, the only thing I would say is that in modern times we, we use this same method. Not exactly this one, but we use this same method for <coughs> maintaining our standards of metrology, period. Yeah. We use the, the, the length of, of, a, of the wavelength of certain kinds of light to maintain our standard. We check our standards against light, and that's what this appears to be doing. So who was doing this eight, nine, ten thousand years ago? Same methods we have now. And so if you didn't follow me on that math, it, I'll just simplify it for you. So again, assuming that radius is one, so it's the base unit of measure, it gets a little bit easier. You can now express the lip diameter as pi base units. You can express the neck diameter as phi squared base units. The foot radius is pi over phi squared base units. These are significant ratios. And it's showing the, the encoding of sacred geometry, I think an understanding of the universe, and obviously, you know, circular geometry with pi. Uh, this is knowledge that we are gleaning from this analysis. We're learning about the people who made these things, which, you know, to the, the conclusion of this is, is interesting because from design to manufacture, you know, the precision, complexity, depth of interrelation between the base features really rules out the idea that this is just random chance. Like this artifact was designed. We're seeing all these signatures of design, it's probably designed mathematically. If it wasn't designed mathematically, how else do you design it? Can you, can you draw it on paper? The vase is about this tall, by the way. It's like six inches tall or something. You try and draw that circle, that 1.1 millimeter circle. You, no one can do it. You certainly can't do it with precision and because we know this was executed with precision. You could draw it on a piece of paper the size of this dance floor, but you still got to be able to scale that thing back down to its dimensions for actual execution uh, in stone. So. It turns out the artifacts best represented mathematically. And we, you know, Mark did this, mathematically designed it, it matched the based model. And then that design was transferred somehow to a manufacturing system and then executed in rose granite with just astonishing precision. And then we talked about this with the loss in positional calibration when you have to do, deal with the lug handles. So it tells you either they were very good at not dealing with that loss in calibration or it was potentially even made on, an, on some sort of system that had five axes of freedom. That's a possibility as well, also along with uh, Chris's solution. But yeah, sophisticated machining. So this is what Mark said, and this is where that logic leads, right? So you go through all the math, you, you, you reverse engineer the design, you figure out, okay, this thing's been designed mathematically. So how do you get it into real world output? And this is kind of where the evidence of logic leads. And I'll just quote directly from Mark's article here, because I think he sums it up really well. And he says, as far as we know, no human beings, trained animals, or naturally occurring phenomena, modern or ancient, take mathematical formulas and equations as input and produce lathe operating motions as outputs. For all of the knowledge and insights we've accumulated over the ages, we know of exactly one and only one category of things capable of such behavior. The kind of thing that we refer to as a Turing machine, a device capable of taking input, holding state, performing operations on held states according to predetermined principles and producing output. Now you can make Turing machines pneumatically, mechanically, hydraulically. We make them electronically and we call this class of device a computer. And no plausible way of representing, operating on or manufacturing the design of this artifact exists without having access to one such. So he's basically taking you through a process to, to lead you to a point that says this, this had to get put through a Turing machine to actually produce the manufacturing output from that design. It's just the only way we know that it can be done. So, you know, I think this is the benefit of looking at, you know, trying to peel back the onion layers on these artifacts. This is the benefit of the, that analysis. And we've, we've, we've learned a tremendous amount about the people who created it. And a lot of this really doesn't line up with the the known capabilities of the of you know the Nadak and Nadak two cultures or whoever in the pre-dynastic times, let alone the old kingdom. But it seems to be much more than just a simple vase. You know, encoded with it are the principles of sacred geometry, the fabric of the universe, the golden ratio, all of this indication that they had sophisticated knowledge and understanding of how the world works. And it 
it does tell a tale of their creators, their capability, their elegance, their sophistication, their knowledge, even their mathematical system, and potentially the way that they viewed reality. And, you know, it's a funny story because it took me a few goes of this article to follow the math and um, get through it and understand truly what Mark was saying in this article. And Nick Sierra, who's much smarter than I am, he got it pretty quickly. And I remember I was sitting at home one night, he, he phoned me up. He's like, dude, I have to talk to you about these faces. He said, I'm, I'm just coming awake at night. He said, I'm just coming awake at night because I cannot believe you know, what, what this means. He just, it, it was like, Nick was fine with the precision. Like, he, he got the metrology, okay, this is super precisely made, but once he really understood what Mark's saying with the, okay, it's so much more than that, it's mathematically designed and then executed and needs a Turing machine. He's just like, this is, he's like, this shit is keeping me up at night. He just had that moment where it, 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 it broke that, it broke his view of the world and, and it, it broke his pers perspective on our own history. It's like he finally is like, man, there was something sophisticated going on and he was convinced of it. And he told me this, this little story. He said, you know what this thing is like? He said, it's kind of like Voyager's golden records, right? The Voyager space probes went out in the 70s, they had these golden records that have basically geometric data and all encoded data and different methodologies to try and transmit information to the to people somewhere or whoever out in the out in space should it get picked up that might tell them a little bit about us, about where we are, who we are, what our capabilities are. And it's not like it's written in English on there. It's encoded with, with you know, geometric principles and other things, wavelength and light. And it even has, a, I think it has some nuclear material on there that serves as a launch clock, like the half-time of plutonium or something's in there. And he said, it's kind of like that, but instead of where Voyager's being sent out in space, it's like this is, this, this is something that's been sent through time to us, to, that encodes this data and it's giving this information. I thought that was... A really powerful analogy i threw it in the slide but yeah there's there's there are a lot more than just a simple vase and what's happened recently finally get to the update part i told you i'd go through it quickly um more vase scans and more analysis this is a, a, po a portion now only a portion this was all of it at the time but matt bell's collection he's he's, he's spending the uh, uh, astronomical resources uh, purchasing vases and i'm very grateful for it and he's having all of these vases scanned. That's the biggest model. Dude, yeah. no, so happy. And these two guys went to his place too. Fantastic. So there's two vases of note that have been scanned. There's more vases that have been scanned. We had a day in Danville, a Danville metal stamp with Chris Dunn. Adam was there. You know, um, Matt was there. Alex and Nick. And this spin, there's a couple of vases of note that were really interesting. One in particular is this spinner vase that is one of those vases, again, sits on the tip of an egg. Tip, tiniest little tip. And you can still spin it, like you can spin this thing and it just spins and spins and spins forever. It's perfectly balanced. It's a remarkable little artifact. And it turns out when it was scanned and when we did the, uh, the, the table analysis and using all of the you know, dial indicators and stuff, remarkably precise, incredible. But its geometry is also very interesting. Uh, and this was a conversation I was having with Dan about this earlier. And in that you can see where this thing sits on the bottom, but the geometry of it is actually like the, the, the sides of it are made up the bottom of the vase is made up or is designed with three circles of the same radius. Note this says R6 here because we also found the radial traversal pattern in this vase. But it's the same radius circles, these three circles, you can see them here. But the center circle protrudes just one millimeter down beneath the others to create the spinning base. So you end up with this little tiny tip from this one circle that just sticks out the bottom and this is kind of what it sits on. And this same circle possibly, was also possibly used to calculate the width of the vessel with the ratio of phi squared, which there's been some analysis done on the, uh, the models of these, of these vessels as well. And shock, horror, we find the same thing as the other vase. We found, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is these, these brackets here. This is the square root of 6 over 2 to the power of whatever. Right? We see the radial traversal pattern. We see the same relationship in the, in the ratios of the circles used to make this vase. And we see it very accurately, 0.01%, 0.01%, like with these are the actual deviations in millimeters, one, you know, one micron, blah, blah, blah. We also, <laughs> we also see those other significant ratios, phi squared, pi, phi over pi, or pi over phi squared. We see the same thing again and again and again in, in the analysis of these ratios. And again, this isn't accidental. You can find pi or phi in, in sculpture, in artwork, in nature, and all of that, but 
this seems to be, and also, it's not always just phi, it's phi squared sometimes, but this, these, these curvatures are deliberately related to each other and it seems like a very deliberate encoding of phi and pi in yeah, these wrestles. So yeah. So just on uh, Mark's analysis, like I, I found in the, in the OG base, Adam's base, there is a phi relationship between the, the circle that would be the uh, lug handle. So if you turn the, if you're looking straight down on the base, the lug handles, the circumference of that circle, or the radius of that circle, and the outer lip of the of the base is it's basically phi. It looked like it to me, and I did a little simple geometric measurement with paper, a printout, and I sent it to him, and it was like a quarter of a millimeter from perfect, which to him was. Uh, a reason to not include it in the analysis because it's an order of magnitude more out of perfect than all of the other measurements that he took. So <laughs> that's that's yeah, a quarter of a millimeter. So it's like yes, you can find pi and phi ratios and things like that in these bases, but like he's he's excluding things that are I mean barely out of perfect. Yeah. So it's 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 uh, it's incredible to me. Like these are these are just the finest yeah. relationships that is that are included in this analysis. Yeah, and that's a good point. We do. I know the Stina and the people that have done this analysis. Same thing. We're just it, we, we're excluding stuff that's out. I mean, you, you know, if something matches it within twenty percent. Is it really matching it? So yeah, it's not there. And luckily enough, she's also automating this process. So you plug in the. The radii and the dimensions of the bays, and, the, and it can actually find these ratios for us. So it's not a manual process anymore, which should make future bays analysis uh, much faster. So, this is the other bays, the ultra thin bays. One of um, Matt's other bays, my probably my favourite. It's a remarkably delicate thing. Amazing that it survived as long as it has in one piece. But two millimeters, it's translucent. You can see the light shining through in the centre. It actually gets down about two millimeters surface thickness. Rose granite. Incredibly, uh, uh, these dial indicators are barely moving on this thing, and these are all measuring in, you know, half hour kind of steps. Uh, also, we see the similar list of, uh, of geometry here. We also see the one radiant arc is used in this too, the, the cone that's formed by the, the top of this thing uh, actually conforms to, a, I think, a one-third radian exactly uh, arc. But you see, again, a long list of significant ratios that have been discovered in this phase, and again, What's the significant thing to me is that the radial traversal pattern is here. That same fixed ratio between the curvatures of the circles seems to be here. And the analysis is ongoing, right? We haven't, this is, we're kind of only scratching the surface at the start of this. Adam's over here, one of the things he was doing, we're, we're hopefully working with a uh, Egyptian university to take this over, have them start analyzing bases that are in the museums here, start doing the engineering, because there's engineers and Egyptologists involved in that, from that institution, you know, and they, they, once they learn the process and they understand what they're looking for, I think they can take it over to be a really interesting uh, project for them, a chance for the Egyptians to take back their own history a little bit. Because if you look at the story of Egyptian history, you could definitely say it's something that's been sort of given to them by Europeans and Westerners. Uh, you know, the, all the Egyptologists and that story of dynastic Egypt is, is probably something that's mostly determined outside of Egypt. You know, Yusuf's father and the the Sufi legends and chematology tells a different story, and this could be a chance for the Egyptians to take back a piece of that for themselves. And that's really where we're going from there. Uh, I can talk about provenance, but I think provenance is covered. We, we are already working with bases with impeccable provenance. It's the nature of the antiquities market that not everything you find on there is going to tell you, you know, you're not going to get impeccable provenance. Uh, eventually, you know, you get too impeccable provenance, Egypt's going to ask for it to come back at some point, potentially. So, you know, stuff comes up in estate sales or in auction houses or from, from antiquities dealers. Might go back to the 80s, might go back to the 60s, might go back further. I know Matt, Matt this is an example of one that, that Matt has, this uh, granodiorite uh, shouldered vase that actually was displayed in museums and it's, it's, it goes back to, um, what does he say? Yeah, it's late Second Dynasty, but impeccable provenance again. So, That's the one that was used in the 
He was. Yeah, this is funny. I've been really waiting for the analysis on this one because one of the guys that made a video saying, oh, these vases are fake, these guys are getting these modern manufactured vessels, he said, here's an example of a vase that isn't fake. And it was this vase, which now happens to be owned by, uh, by Matt. So, it's get yeah, analyzed. it's going to get analysed and I might, uh, I might make a point of uh, looking at it in a video. We'll see. So, yeah, anyway, we're working on... Um, this is happening. I mean, I'm, I'm not really working on I'm documenting it and I'm happy to be involved, but... Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I'm super excited that this project moves forward. I'm also. I'm also very hopeful that it can form the basis for an extension of this type of analysis for other artifacts. I'm. Uh, I've got ideas in my head about trying to leverage some of these relationships, or potentially see what it would take to say, let's go scan all the Serapian boxes. Let's do this and that. I think this is the sort of data we need uh, going forward. So. Yeah. Lots more work's happening. We've got scans of these things, and as I said, a lot of these are now also being scanned in CT scanners, which is much even higher resolution than structured light stuff so far. So we should be able to um, uh, just have even more accurate scans and get more data out of it, hopefully. Okay, that is my update on the bases. So, so they really haven't done anything close to uh, replicating it with current technology? Uh, uh, the question was, it done anything, um, has, anything, has anyone replicated this with current technology? Do I think they could do it? Yes, I, it, we could do it, certainly, I think we could. As far as I know, nobody has. I, I would love for someone to try, with the disclaimer that don't hurt yourself, because there's a guy in my comments that might have hurt himself at some point, but I was like, you know. <laughs> Like, you can get, you can watch a video on how to change the oil in your car, but don't let the car fall on you, you know? Like, <laughs> tools are dangerous. So, We're gonna these guys are going to try, actually. They're going to try and make stuff. I mean, I mean, make them from acrylic, make them from aluminum, yeah, aluminum yeah, yeah, for yeah, these trains. Yeah. Yeah. Start that way, and then work up to, like, rose granite, you know? Right, yeah. We get a 3D print. Can we, can you get a 3D print? Yeah, you can print the base. Yep. I'm not, I mean, it's not my, it's not my, scan to sell or anything like that but a lot of a lot of people have downloaded the base and printed it i even have a few like because there's some issues with printing that particular base so i have some people that have fixed up the scan and put that on there too on my on my website okay. and i believe matt matt bell is also he's literally going to be selling prints of his vases and i think the scans i have right now are watermarked with his company on it cool. Thank you. Matt, so this is connor is that a radial traversal pattern that's what he called it. He called it the radial traversal pattern. And not for nothing, uh, someone in the comments showed me that it actually conforms to musical scale as well, the traversal pattern. And then Robert Edward Grant at CPAC yeah. found that found those musical scales in an analysis of the, the angle, slope angles of the pyramids and the proportionality of proportions of the Giza Plateau. So he may well be finding the exact same mathematical pattern in the pyramids. and in the Giza Plateau, and I'm going to talk to him when I get back, we, I'm going to go on his show, but we had a great conversation at CPAC, and I, that's, it was fascinating to me to hear that, particularly once someone showed me that this conforms to musical scale, which is, you know, I'm a drummer, I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what was that? yeah, Robert, uh, Robert Evergrant, yeah, so I'm going to talk to him, I don't know, he did a fascinating presentation about it, I, I want to talk to him some more, yeah. So Ben, there were people that know about that made these things like this. Did they make everything like that? I mean, what could it tell us about their society? I mean, were these, could these have been special objects to them, or just everything they made well, precise like this? You know, it's, no, definitely not everything. We have vases that are not this accurate, I'll tell you that. There's definitely vases that are an order of magnitude less precise. One thing is interesting in like an early thing, Adam and I have talked about it a couple of times and it sort of almost conforms to what we saw in the statues at Luxor, right? So the rose granite ones seem to be the most precise. Not always, but they, they seem to be like the big colossi at the Ramesseum's rose granite, the, 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 the best polished and sort of deepest cuts and the smoothest statues seem to have been rose granite. And we're seeing a similar thing in the vases. So far the rose granite ones are the ones that seem to have the most precision, but that may not be always always the case. In fact, Matt's recently acquired, I think the most expensive one he's, he's bought, it's not rose granite, it's another stone, and it's, 
it's it's average. So if you average one of these, like say the OG bays, might have an average of say four or five thousandths of an inch across all the measurements. This base Matt has, based on the CT scans, is like between zero and one thousandths of an inch average deviation from it. So it's like the most precise one we've seen so far that isn't rose granite. But there's definitely ones that are, are not as precise. So it's not, yeah, not everything is made like this. And maybe and another way, it's probably even more complex than that with other artifacts. Not every aspect of everything is made with this much precision. But even when you say say a box at the Serapium, we know that it's got this precise at the top of the at the top of the inside is super precisely flat and well made and exactly sort of perpendicular and, and, and flat with the with the lid on top of it, but it may not be as precise on the bottom. Who knows why? That they might not have needed to do that. But the fact that you once you even just see that precision, like if you see it like you still have to explain that precision. It doesn't have to be all precise, but once you, you're seeing precision somewhere, it's still, that's still a, that, to me, that's a question that needs answering. But I, look, I don't know why or what my, my, my guess is that these vases were functional. I don't think they were purely intended as vases. Sometimes I look at the lug handles and they remind me of like a cam lock, like these things are locking in, maybe they're resonators, maybe they're part of a larger system. Maybe they aren't. I don't know. I, I don't want to be close-minded to any of it. Okay, so Ben just spoke about the precision part of your question, but the other part I think is, is the design aspect. Yeah. The, these numbers that are being used in the, the design itself, that are then, it's then expressed in the object so well through precision that we can then pull them out of the, of the object itself, which is what, what has happened with the scans. That is reflected in many places around the world, and I mean, we've, you know, cathedrals have this. Some of the best cathedrals, like you, you see this in monumental architecture, um, in some of the best works of art across the ages. So yeah, there is something there, and I, it, it's interesting because you know you look at you look at this vase, and I guarantee you that the way that all these crystals are put together in these in the stone are using those numbers. That, that's what's amazing about it. It's it, it's literally how the universe constructs itself. So these are fundamental rules to nature. And then the, the designers and, and builders of these objects have learned that about the universe, and then they've applied them to the objects that they were constructing. And they did it so well that we're able to see it with these tiny deviations. But the universe itself has tiny deviations in it as well. We're able to, when we look at the universe on microscopic, all the way up to the macroscopic scale, you see these fundamental concepts and these fundamental numbers, phi and pi. But the universe itself can't quite replicate them perfectly, it never does. There's always a little bit of error because you're dealing with, with matter, with material, you know, with the material realm. So, but it's, it's so well done that you can see it, you can see the, the abstract concept behind it, but it isn't perfect, just like the vases. And that's what's, that's what's really amazing about them. And that's why you can imagine you know, the concept that the, the gods did this. Because this is exactly what you see with the universe itself. So if you just right. let your mind go absolutely wild, yeah. what could this be telling us? <laughs> what could uh, the, tell old, us? the old speculation question. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Rogan asked me three goddamn times. <laughs> What's your wild speculation? I, like, I don't know. I, for me, I, I'll let you guys answer this too, because I'm sure you have opinions on it. Um, uh, look, I, 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 I think it's, I think we're looking at the remnant, and even in the symbology and what we see written on these temples, I do, I do think there's, we're looking at potentially the remnants of some sort of functional technology that we don't have the context to fully understand, right? It's, it's that you've probably all heard me use the example of the iPhone, like a blank iPhone going back in time, 100 years, 50 years, but a thousand years or whatever, and you just, it looks like a shiny black rock or a piece of glass to them. But to us, we have all the context to understand what it means. We, we know what a touchscreen is, a camera, the internet, Wi-Fi's, you know, all the, all the components that you look at a cell phone and we know, a keyboard. Yeah, we, we, we have that context to understand what it is and what its capabilities are. But if you lack that context, it just looks like a shiny piece of glass. I think there's a chance we're looking at some of these things and we lack context to fully understand it yet, which is why I'm, I've always tried to say that we should be looking at this stuff with an open mind. We shouldn't always just put it in a box 
uh, this, this box of, this is a subset of what we know today. Like this is this has to be contained within a subset of what we know and how we would solve these problems and how we would do things. Therefore, everything's ceremonial, symbolic, whatever. Uh, I think if we looked at it with a bit more of an open mind and we just followed and we analyzed them as deeply as we can and we follow the evidence to wherever it leads, we might actually learn something. You never know. Um, there's plenty of examples of this happening throughout history, you know, discoveries and things that happen that just made something that seemed completely impossible or magic just automatically just become reality overnight. Like, oh, okay, it turns out you can you can send power and signal waves across the you know the surface interaction between the air and the ground, like xenic surface waves and things like this, which you would have been just called a lunatic if you'd suggested before they figured out you could do it. Um, endless examples like that, and I just think we might be looking at that with this, and, and but I don't know where it leads. I don't, the how it worked or what it did, I, that's pure speculation, uh, I don't know. But I'm try, I will speculate a bit, I'm, <laughs> I'm writing this book, I'm definitely, the idea is I want to give myself the context and room to move to actually speculate about what I think could have possibly happened, timelines, what it might have looked like, that type of thing. Uh, while you're doing this work, you're like in real time, like this is just all relatively new. You yeah. know, it's just so like, it's kind of amazing to be just sitting here while this is like unfolding. And like, is, I mean, the negative comments, the, they're hiding bases that have the scripture, or like the scratchings on yeah. it. They're removing that as you guys are like, how aware of your work do you think they are? Like there's negative comment generators. Uh, they're creating Tataria Flat Earth fucking memes. And, <laughs> and, you know, and you so know the mud flutter, bro? Yeah, well, no. and, well, and Zahi Wahas is watching the, I mean, how aware, I mean, like, but it's just like, the implications are just so fucking, well, like, that's the, paradigm shifting. That's the, know? I think that's the threat, yes. That's the, that, that paradigm shifting threat. That's the threat of, I mean, Look no further than the discussion around tube drills, right? It's been going on 150 years. People will not admit that there is a spiral groove on that core seven. It will not, it, they, no one, they will never admit it because you might think it's a simple thing. Oh, it's a, it's a spiral thread. No, no, it's horizontal. Because if it's spiral, then it has this cascading set of effects that really threaten everything we think we know about the dynastic Egyptian and the whole story starts to fall apart. And it, 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 you know, Russ is talking about these stacked assumptions, and that's really with the story of history as we know it. It's, it's a series of stacked assumptions. I mean, literally the way they, I mean, as an example, like, like Sneferu built his three giant pyramids, the, you know, the Modum pyramid, the Bent pyramid, the Red pyramid. He did that in 40 years. The reasoning is because if Khufu did his in 25 years, then surely Sneferu could have done it in 40. <laughs> that's the assumption. And it's like, you just look, well, did Khufu build his in 25 years? They're just assuming that's correct. And that that's the way the, the House of Cards and that story's built, and they put it together. And I mean, it, it's... Are you it's, coming up against any, like, sure. sort of pushback uh, like that? I mean, like, yeah, I mean, sure, there's plenty of mainstream shills, for want of a better term, that, that the standard model shills that will get in and say, oh, it's just go read a book on Egyptian history, you'll figure it out. Um, that happens a lot. But it's... Look, it's I wouldn't say it's unique to... Uh, archaeology to have this type of dogmatic protection of the of the, the establishment narrative that's the nature of it and on i think the reality is as it is with many scientific fields it's you know planks constant right science advances one funeral at a time and maybe that's the case here too we'll see but the other thing that's nice about academics is one of the reasons why i think it honestly they get a lot they're threatened about it and you can see if you read the sia the site the society of american archaeology journals they're, they're desperately trying to figure out how to get themselves involved in popular culture, podcasts and stuff. Because effectively, every, it's like we're doing an end run around them. And in some cases, yeah. like, I'm not sure we really need them anymore. I mean, obviously, they're the guys who control access. They can do the work and the experiments and all that stuff. But in terms of the knowledge and the audience and the, the growth of some of these ideas, it's an, it's, it is happening as an end run around, around those standard models. Like, that's why I respect and I always enjoy reading older accounts from these archaeologists and the Victorian era guys, Petrie, all these other guys. Because, the, you know, Petrie knew when he was looking at something he couldn't explain. He still tried to explain it in the context of dynastic Egyptians because he didn't have all this other cataclysm and longer timeline information. But, you know, he was arguing with his peers forever about technology and the, the, the tube drills and stuff. They could do that because the only place these discussions ever happened were in academic halls of residence, and they happened in these institutions. And the, you know, the 
these these clubs, Explorers Club or whatever, and, you know, there are all these guys. But now it's 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 shifted out of that. It doesn't just happen in universities anymore. Now we've got the rise of alternative writers and authors. It used to be in books. Now it's in you know new media like YouTube and whatnot, and it's getting embraced. And Graham Hancock gets to do a a show on Netflix about it, and everybody loses their goddamn mind. That's what happened. Um, and that in particular, the hoops and the SAA—they're like sending letters to Netflix, like, "Oh my God, how did you? Why did you do this?" You know. So, yeah, yes, we get those comments, but I, it doesn't bother me, and it's—I think it's natural, fine with it. I just—I mean, just they need to try and explain it. Nobody, nobody, as far as the bases go, nobody's challenging the data. That's the nice thing about it. The data is super solid. You can't. Here's the model. Go figure it out. Like you can do that. But now they're oh, the bases are fake. It's just stupid shit. Usually, you can ignore Adam. Uh, can I make a few comments? Please, you want the mic? <laughs> you want to speak it into the mic or speak up? If yeah, you want, yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mud flush. Adam will be talking at the Cosmic Summit. Uh, amazing presentation, by the way. Yeah. yeah. The, a couple of things. So, the originally when we first did that first scan, where it's like yellow and blue, that was from like a almost two years ago now, and um, yeah, we're trying to fit different shapes of the vase, like cylinders, spheres, because it looks round, so it's natural to want to fit a sphere. I actually now believe that that's probably wrong for the body, and what I've seen, and we're trying to establish this in as many as we can, it's a quadratic formula. So it's inverted and then rotated around, right? So you could, you guys are all asking about the look angles and how do we remove material so that it conforms to the shape of the vase. You have that as a guide. It's a formula, so anywhere you are on the formula, you know where to go next. So that's potentially one thing. Another thing is when we set these things in our Cartesian XYZ, the grid system, we have to do that every time. So we were using Polyworks, that's the yellow and blue one. Um, that has an automatic functionality that does that, but there can be a mistake there, right? So some of the error you see can be explained by where it's sitting in the Cartesian. Yeah. Um, what else? Oh, the radial trip to reversal pattern. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So six root six over two, you can actually simplify that, which actually becomes three over two. Yeah. So this, it's root three over two, root one point five, which is the ratio for the perfect fit. The perfect fit, right? And you're scaling that up with an exponent, right? So that makes sense because like the area of a circle is pi root squared. Yeah. So that's probably what you were talking about now, Grant. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Grant. Yeah, Grant. Yep. I don't know why we that's keep saying root six over two. It's, I think yeah. it's three over two. Uh, it, it really does, yeah. It's, yeah. But Adam, where did you get your glass from? Um, well, these aren't mine. These are Matt's, I think. Mine, I have a whole bunch of them. And I started looking for them about 10 years ago. And so, you know, art dealers, the antiquities market, but the province is important, and not everyone I own is, is special. I mean, some are, they look good in a picture, but you actually get it up close, and it's like, this is way off, it's not even worth continuing, you know? And some of them, even though they're not precise, you still see the crystal inclusions cut at the same arc as the rest of the diorite and the granite, which is in and itself impressive, even if the accuracy is not there. And I like saying accuracy because these are designed. So how close are we to the true design? That's your tolerance. It's a standard deviation. That's all we're really measuring, from you know the absolute distance from perfection from a perfect circle. That's all that tolerance means. Yeah. But there's no way to tell how old relative your yours is to the perfect ones. Yours could have been early iterations or something like that. But you, there's no way to tell. Right? All the ones he's showing are perfect, but um, all the ones he's showing in the museum are not. Even though they're granite, diorite, they have the big crystals in them. They're not all perfect. Yeah. What's so it's a subset. What percentage would you say is like the highly accurate ones? It depends on what your sample size, you know, what, what's your universe. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, people yeah, pick yeah. them out, you know, nobody really cares about clay, but there's far more clay pyrene balls yeah. than there are granite vessels. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, in terms of percentages, we don't know yet. Like, it's the data set's not big enough. I mean, uh, I think in the sample size, the ones that we've looked at on tables, I mean, we sat there and we'd be scanned like six or seven at Danville, put it on the road tab, and did stuff and we stopped but we yeah we stopped on a few of them just because we knew they weren't gonna give good numbers but a lot of them were i mean 
where's the picture with Matt's collection? I mean, there's, yeah, certainly not all of these, maybe half of them might show those those aspects, but I, I actually haven't seen his latest scans. I've got to catch up with him when I get back, and he's going to have more more data on that. Have and we'll definitely do an update. Have you any of those really, really small ones? No, uh, not, not as far as I know. He actually has a really interesting uh, little tiny thing here, this little, like, it's like a crisp, rock crystal, quartz crystal test tube looking thing. Mm. You actually can see a spiral groove of the tube on the internal, like it's translucent. You can see it on the inside hollow where they, they drilled down into it to, to drill that out. But yeah, this, a lot of these questions hopefully get answered with the data set getting, um, getting improved over time. So, was there any testing of resonances of those vases? Say that again. Was there any testing of resonance in the vases? Resonance, yes, as a matter of fact. Not by me, but you guys. Kyle. Kyle did that. Res that was there any testing on resonance on the vases? Uh, yes, yeah, some rudimentary testing uh, using vocal cords. <laughs> we use the machine too. I did. I did. I have a tone generator on the phone, and we put it in the speaker, a little little Bluetooth speaker, and do a do a frequency sweep. But I mean, this is it's easily done with the voice, and you can hear it just like you do a sweep, like you move up, and then it there's just this tone. Obviously, the the fundamental resonant frequency of the interior airspace of the bass and it just comes out like a like a horn it's very loud yeah very noticeable and uh so then we got the we used the tone generator and we're just doing the sweep to and i was just doing this with matt like check this out you can download this app on your phone this tone generator and you can find all these for all the bases we did you know three or four of them quickly just for the fun of it and uh I don't remember exactly what the frequencies were, but that's another uh, point of analysis. Like, what are these frequencies? I know in Chris Dunn's book, uh, The Keys of Power Plan, he talks about this thing called the Helmholtz Resonator, which is essentially a sphere with a hole in it. And you put in a signal, you know, an audio signal or, that matches that frequency of the sphere, and it amplifies it. So it's a, it's a natural amplifier. It resonates and it amplifies it, and you can step up that amplification by using a series of Hel Helmholtz resonators, as he describes in the book. So a vase is essentially a Helmholtz resonator. So that's one possible function of these things if we're going to just go out on a, you know, just like way out there. These could be uh, natural uh, amplifiers. Yeah, yeah. I think Matt. Uh, I think he did a he did a little post update. I responded to it the other day. I, as I recall, I think he's he talked about doing more resonance tests. Uh, and again, I'll catch up with him when I get back. But check out Matt Matt Bell's channel. He's limitless. Limitless. He's uh, he's putting this data out there. He's also been releasing like provenance for vases. He's he's uh he was back and forth for a while. He was like, don't mention my name on some of them. And now he's out there. He's like, look at all these vases I got. This guy's so, uh, I'm happy. I'm like, I was like, like I can stop editing my videos. B-E-A-L-L, -L, limitless on, on, the, on YouTube. He's, he's a good guy. Yeah. What, what was the thing in Chris Dunn's book that he talked about when somebody was doing some experiment and it caused the whole pyramid to start vibrating? That's Tesla. Tesla. Yeah. Well, Tesla nearly should be. Yeah, Tesla nearly shook a building apart by by the historical account. He said Tesla said something like, "Give me a what do you say, like 12 pounds of air pressure, and I'll knock a building down." Yeah, five pounds of air. So what he was building, what Tesla was building, is uh, what he called the mechanical oscillator, and it simply uses compressed air, and it's a piston in a cylinder, and there's just an arrangement of pathways for the air that when the air first comes in, it pushes the piston in one direction, and when the piston moves in that direction, it cuts off the air supply and channels the air to the other side of the piston, pushes it back the other way, and then it does the same thing in reverse. So the piston's just essentially floating. because the So he described it as a cylinder of fine steel floating in air because the air also Surrounds, surrounds the piston under pressure so you don't really need 
you need machining to do this, but essentially floats this piston and it's, it's vertical, it's a reciprocating motion inside this device. And with five pounds of air, you can get this thing resonating. It, it creates a frequency of mechanical vibration. You can tune it by the, the piston having a shaft and you add weights to the shaft. So it will slow it down or speed it up, but it's very, uh, very regular vibration. And so he had also been expounded on this. This was actually a, an invention that he was trying to improve upon the steam engine where he made this device. And so he, he made one small piston that caused the resonating of a larger piston with its outgassing, which caused the resonation of an even larger piston. And so you could just keep doing this and step it up using five pounds of air and eventually shake something incredibly large. And uh, if you tune it and you get the right frequency, everything has a resonant frequency. Uh, people use the galloping Gertie bridge as an example. That's you know wind generated oscillations. But you know uh, an object like the pyramid has a resonant frequency when you include all of its mass. So if you can create a mechanical vibration that can match that frequency, uh, and you you amplify it enough, you'll break it apart. It's the same principle of like the lady singing into the wine glass and shattering the wine glass. You find the resonant frequency of the glass. When you sing loud enough, it shakes the glass so much that it breaks. So this is, yeah, I mean, he was, he was right. He could do that. He almost destroyed his lab. He, he, yeah, it was his lab. They were in the, in the, like the bottom floor of this of this building and he he was experimenting with this thing and he he actually attached it to like one of the main support beams of the building just like let's see you know. and he <laughs> tunes it and he get like the building started shaking so much that people in the building freaked out and they called the police and everything and then he uh i guess the thing was going he hit it with a sledgehammer as he described it to, to stop it <laughs> instead of just you know undoing the air supply i don't know but uh yeah it's, it's much more dramatic hitting it with a sledgehammer to stop it so yeah they thought it was an earthquake that it was his little mechanical oscillator cool all right um i will uh, one more reminder if you want to go to abyss and bell or any of the uh, special permissions mo has Came and told me. So he's right here. If you want to sign up with him, but yeah, otherwise, to meet them, yeah. come over here. Yeah. One other bit of news is that the uh, Ministry of Antiquities in Egypt was fired today, like two hours ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, Mo predicted this. Ah. He told me a month ago. He said, "Guys, getting fired for sure." Oh, uh, he today, said with Ziri today, today, today officially. officially. <laughs> Because of Mankara. Yes. Mankara. Oh, and that because of Zai. Yeah, he crossed to us. And because of Zai. Oh, yeah. oh, so that's yeah. what I mean, like yeah. that real time, like obfuscation, like just. Was that? I'm, I, was I, I was going to say something very positive about the future, which I, I love the, the okay. fact that the Scan Pyramids project is ongoing and they're doing a lot of different testing and, and, uh, and work on various different aspects that we've learned since we've been here the last five weeks. Okay, so uh, but I, I, I hope that it. I hope this has nothing yeah, to do with it, because that, I mean, these guys are doing great work, and you know, we're talking about no. uh, mainstream archaeology no. and I mean, all these mainstream narratives in science and, and all this research, and there there really are wonderful people in all of these fields. We've met quite a few on these trips. Uh, that you are your son. Do not subscribe wholeheartedly to the standard model. They they recognize the holes in the model and they are actively pursuing other avenues of research to to uh, improve our understanding of our past. And it's it's great. It's you know people like the Scan Pyramids Project uh, is is an example of that. And I would also say the work that's being done at Gobekli Tepe is excellent. Uh, and Karahan Tepe, just over there, they, they sort of don't really have this big dogma built up, but you can see the power of the narrative that gets created for the public in the, uh, the world's first temple, intentionally buried 
Like these were early ideas that became entrenched in the narrative for the public, for public consumption. And they're, they're still there. I mean, Gobekli Tepe is not the world's first temple because Karahan Tepe is at least 500 years older. But this, this is, you can kind of see like in Turkey the way that this is, ha that, that it kind of gets entrenched, right? But they're not sticking with that narrative. The newest papers coming out are changing it uh, slowly. But these guys are open-minded and they're doing a lot of great work that I, I would hope in the future, yeah, some yeah, of the, yeah, yeah. the ways that they are going about <coughs> dating these sites I was could be utilized in places like Egypt. Yeah, there's, I know a, there's, and uh, I'm sure it's going to happen. So I, I am uh, optimistic about the future uh, in these fields of archaeology. There's a lot of great people coming up. So I just want to say, uh, we're, look, we're wrapping it up here, but. Um, we're all interested in these subjects because of the mystery of our history, our own history. And has civilization risen and fallen on this planet multiple times? Uh, so much so that, it's, that, that the older ones have been almost completely lost, except in stories uh, and some artwork. And then they're sort of passed down in this fragmented way. I think that these vases are, I mean, this is a smoking gun. For, I mean, you, can't, you, you cannot look at this information and the fact that we know that some of these are very old, they, they are pre-dynastic, okay? They are older than the known advanced civilization of dynastic Egypt. So there's something much older than that. And then we also have Gobekli Tepe, Tepe like Kyle was saying. So we know people were where, uh, yes, and then there's Gunung Padang also, the, the work being done in Indonesia that may go back 22,000 years. There's, pl there's other sites, you know, Peru has, there's possibilities there. Uh, it's difficult to connect the bases to that, but this at least, we can look at this and say, these are very old. They're older than the known advanced civilization here. Somebody in deep prehistory was doing something with precision that we couldn't even recognize until modern times. That it, you know, the Petri was looking at these and saying, there's something here, but he didn't have the tools to do this kind of analysis and see how precise they are. And even our own analysis, as, as Adam was just saying, it's possible that we're getting errors built in, trying to use computers to analyze the, the hundreds of thousands of points that we've got from the scans of these things. So we don't yet know how precise they are either. So this is a, this is kind of a key that may unlock something. and we. The other thing we know, and we've discussed this multiple times throughout the trip, is the, uh, and Ben did it in the presentation, is that there is a recent, very violent destruction of the planet that the whole world went through. It caused a mass extinction of megafauna. We are megafauna. We almost all died. We barely survived it. And if there was, if we had advanced civilizations, when that took place, they're gone. We like to build near water, and the sea levels rose. 400 feet, you know, and all of, all of our cities, pretty much most of them are next to water. So either you have enormous floods coming down from the melting of the ice and just erasing every city that was next to a river, or you have cities on the coastlines that are now some, some, sometimes hundreds of miles out from the current coastlines because they've just been inundated and it's still that way. The flood, that flood continues to this day. That, that stuff is still underwater. So I think this is great because we go around looking in Egypt and we see places like Menkara, we see the Assyrian, we see the Valley Temple, we see the Serapium. And this, the evidence with these vases gives us a good reason to take a second look at these objects and say, okay, we know somebody in deep prehistory was making very precise objects. Could they have been making these? And does that change the story? Of the accepted story of what's really going on here in Egypt. So I, it's funny to me because go back to Mark Lehner's question, show me the pot shirts. Well, it's the here are the pot shirts. Sorry, they're not broken. <laughs> they're not, yeah, they're not shirts. <laughs> but even, even There's the, plenty of shirts of them as well, as we saw beneath the Step Pyramid. Even, even the imprecise ones are kind of yeah. um, um, yeah. marble, right? Crazy. Yeah, I can, uh, I can finish with one little thing, if you like. Just to um, round this out, because I started somewhere and I thought maybe I'll finish there. 
It's right at the end, 100 slides later, <laughs> which we won't go through now. But I, I mentioned this concept earlier, and I just want to finish with this and we'll call it. But we talked about this concept of going from the Stone Age to the Space Age uh, as soon as the projector, my well, Space Age projector works, there we go. <laughs> um, this concept of that 6,000 years linear line of development of civilization, this concept that's baked into schools, and again, we get taught this from a young age, and whether you know history or not, this, this is a concept that rattles around in our heads and we're taught this. But what if we could actually change this? Like this is, I, I like this idea, it's why I think this whole investigation, digging into these mysteries is important, because imagine we took this from something like this to more to like towards something like this, right? A new tenet of what modern civilization is, this oscillating pattern that goes between civilization and cataclysm. The idea that we've risen before only to be knocked down back to the Stone Age, barely survive things, and we lose our memory. We get these loose cultural associations and stories that come down through history, and as we fight our way out of the, you know, a, a hunter-gatherer existence once again and rise up into civilization, on a long enough time scale, right, this is guaranteed to happen again. It's gonna happen to us eventually. It might be a million years, it might be a thousand years, it might be less, but, if we all understood this concept, it might help us to put, you know, our own civilization, our own behavior into a new context, right? We, we might, it might change the way that we behave, it might change our priorities in the long term. And that there's actually examples for this type of thing happening, this, this, a new, something getting injected into the zeitgeist of humanity, the collective conscience of the humanity, and, you, and whether you agree with it or not, or, you know, it's overly politicized or not, but you, I think we can all agree in the last 25 years that the, the, the term climate change has been a term that's changed that zeitgeist of humanity. It's changed our interactions, it's changed, it changes our investment decisions, it changes how we, we interact with the planet, with each other. It's been a concept, particularly younger generations now, like it, it really is a, it's a factor that in their behavior and how they run their life. And I just, I, I like to think of the possibilities of if we started to teach this type of a model in schools at an early age, people understood that we're not the first. You know, there's been other civilizations on this planet and they were destroyed, despite their, what, the clear obvious evidence for their advanced capabilities. And we find ourselves today in a position of advanced capability. We have the potential to be able to do something about it. We can actually address some of these long-term problems. And we might be able to change some of our priorities instead of worrying about building more tanks and guns and bullets in the next election cycle or quarterly results, maybe we start to focus a bit more on the longer term problems, getting off the planet, spreading out into space and, you know, actually guaranteeing our survival as a species. So I do think that's as altruistic as it sounds. I think that's the end goal. And that's why I, I do think this whole investigation, this, this topic is, is important for us. I don't think it's, it's just not like an academic, you know, what happened in the past, who cares? No, I think it's, it can provide us a new context for how we look at ourselves on the planet, so, yeah, thank you guys very much. Oh, simplify that diet. Could simplify that diet. <laughs> <laughs> it's a snake. Ouroboros. Yeah, I should just put the Ouroboros on there, shouldn't I? And just say, see, brothers of the serpent. <laughs> thank you guys. Well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Looking forward to more. Can I ask you my question? Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Good. So, first, your All right. Thanks for watching the stream. We're out of here. Cheers.